Dear Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name, Father. We thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for every bite of food, every drink of water, every time that you are in our presence and we can feel your presence, especially when we can feel your presence. We thank you for being everything to us. We thank you for helping us to move forward in sanctification. We pray, Father God, that you will further sanctify our walk, that we can grow grow, grow closer to you. We pray in the name of Jesus, Father God, that as we grow closer to you over this time, this time, Father God, that, that it allows each and every one of us to draw closer on our knees to you, that you will convert us, Father God, further, that you will sanctify us further, further, further in our walk, Father God. We just praise you. We thank you, Jesus, for everything that you have done for us, every insult that you bore for us, everything that you have done. We praise your holy name, and we thank you for being a part of us. We praise you for being in us. We thank you for overflowing us with your liquid love that we can touch people around us and draw them into the kingdom just by virtue of our presence around about them. We praise you, Father God, for filling us with your Holy Spirit this evening. We thank you, Father God, for touching every single listener of this radio show, past, present, and future. We pray in the name of Jesus that they will have heard the message, they will continue to hear the message, to stay at the ready in Jesus' name, that we are to seek you, Father God, on our knees, Father, in our prayer closets, and draw as close as we possibly can, now seeking every gift of the Holy Spirit and outpouring that we can. Father, we pray that you will mold us as the potter, mold us, Father, and and, and create us as as new wineskins for the outpouring of the new wine. We know that at any time, Father, the earth can turn completely upside down. We don't pretend to be able to predict your time. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will keep us sober and steady, focused on the things of this kingdom, Father God, focused on your works and good and, and the good things that we can do on behalf of the love that is overflowing in our heart for our Lord Jesus. We pray, Father God, that you will change us and mold us and move us and, and just bring us to a place of complete comfort in the, wor- in, the, in, the, in the works that we are doing on behalf of you. Help to open our eyes. Help us to see opportunities. We pray for a spirit of boldness upon each of us, that we can touch the people in the realm of our influence, Father, there, in, our, in our workplace, on, on break at, in, in lines at stores, Father, help us to have that spirit of boldness come down on each one of us. We pray in Jesus' name that we will not be discouraged. We pray in Jesus' name and come against the demons of, the, of discouragement in Jesus' name. We rebuke the spirits of doubt. We rebuke the spirits of discouragement, and we command them to get out of our lives in Jesus' name. We cancel the assignments of the demons of death upon our lives. We cancel the assignments of the powers of the air upon our lives. In the name of Jesus, we command that the demons demons of death to go into the pit. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father, for surrounding us with your holy fire. If we have two holy warrior angels in our presence, Father God, we pray that you will send four. If we have four, we pray for eight. We pray in the name of Jesus, Father God, that you will send down powerful and mighty warrior angels in our presence to protect every single threat vector in our lives. If we have loved ones, if we have sons and daughters, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will send these angels down to protect their jobs, to protect their cars. Father God, we pray for a holy fire around them. We praise your holy name and we thank you, Lord Jesus, hallelujah, Lord Jesus, for protecting all of our loved ones with your resources, with heaven's resources and heaven's powers. We thank you, Father, for everything that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you for changing our direction at a time in our lives when we were at the ready to make that final turn, to run to you, Lord Jesus. And we pray in Jesus' name that no matter what happens, no matter how dark the darkness gets, no matter how dry the desert gets, no matter what, Father God, that we will draw closer to you in our prayer. If we have to go through a period of, 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 of famine, Father God, and we don't see your holy workings in our lives, if we don't see the miracles occurring as we believe that they shall, that we have patience, Father God. We, we, we pray, uh, the, the, the book of Job, we pray verse 13, uh, 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 Job 13, verse 15, Father God, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will give us that courage, the courage and the patience of Job to go through the desert like the Israelites did. If that is what is required of us, we pray in the name of Jesus for that patience to make us perfect, that we stay on our knees and believe, and we never stop believing because we know that you will pour out your power, that you will pour out your glory, that you will pour out the manna upon our tabletops, and that you will supernaturally light our entire houses, Father, and heat them when the bitter cold is freezing out the people who are unrighteous, that we might draw them to the foot of the cross and bring them home as guests to the marriage supper. We glorify in your holy name, Father God, and we thank you for choosing us for a time time such as this. We thank you for keeping us at the ready. Father, don't let us backslide. 
We pray in Jesus' name that you will keep us full of the presence of your Holy Spirit in all that we say, all that we do, and all that we think. We are beseeching you, Father God, for blessed is he who hungers and thirsts for righteousness. For he shall, he shall be filled. And not to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and present us faultless before the presence of your glory, Father God, with exceeding joy. Jesus, and to you, Father, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Father God, it is so hard. It is so hard for us to wait, those of us who have been waiting so long. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will give us activities to keep us busy that will, that will just bless you, Father God, as we just glorify your name, that, that we will find ways to get out and touch people, that we will find ways to get out, whether it be uh, finding a hobby, riding bikes, uh, getting involved with different, different uh, uh, you know, um, missions and things that are going on around our town, getting involved with, uh, you know, um, uh, prison ministries. Father, we just thank you. Father, whether it be uh, whatever the opportunity is that you can lay before each and every one of us, Father, we just ask you to touch our lives, to open up our horizons, that we are able to get out, Father, get Get out into public, get out into the, go for hikes, go for walks in the mountains, go for walks along the beaches if we are so blessed to be nearby them, to enjoy the beauty of the world that you have laid before us, Father God, as we wait, as we wait upon the Lord, as you renew our strength, as we mount up with wings with eagles and we walk and we're not weary, we run and we do not faint. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to serve you. We praise you, Father, for opening our eyes to the things that are happening all around this world. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Glory to Jesus. So check this out. I thought this was a pretty cool quote. And, um, and, and, and yeah, we're going to move pretty quickly. Uh, I, uh, again, we're overloaded with stuff. And, folks, we got – oh, and we got Brother Sammy Mwangi joining us at uh, 9.15 to give us an update. They are really – it is amazing. The, the gifts, the love that come from the people that listen to this ministry. You know, I don't know who a lot of you are. I, I don't know. I would I would submit that maybe one or point oh five percent maybe have reached out and sent me an email, said hello over the years. I always am powerfully, powerfully blessed whenever um I get an email from somebody who I don't know, an email from an address I've never seen before. But I know you're out there. Um, you know, Harm, brother Harm Timmerman. Uh, I hope you I hope I pronounced your last name, brother, properly. But um, you know, has uh, you know he he has emailed me about people. You know, he he said, brother John, you don't realize, but there's a group of people in the Philippines. There's over that over 300 people gathered together, and listen to the radio show. You know, we you can't trust even the numbers that you see on the consoles. I I mentioned this before in prior shows how they they dork around constantly and they say, well, we're trying to get you know organic listens and there's web crawlers that are distorting the numbers, so we're going to adjust this, that, and the other thing. And um, so you look at the charts, you look at the numbers, and all I do is I just pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. Now, I also know that big numbers don't mean good things. Okay, all you got to do, as a matter of fact, the bigger the church is, the more likely the Brotherhood of Satan has infiltrated it. I learned that a long time ago, and it's, it's really kind of scary, really, when you think about it. So when, for those of you who are in, in churches that have uh, two, three, four, five hundred members or a thousand, two thousand, three thousand members or more, oh, watch out. I would do a, a double take on the things that are being said from that pulpit because the, in, the information from the whistleblowers that have been involved, raised up as uh, – uh, you know, as members of the Brotherhood of Satan, uh, as members of uh, even darker organizations like, you know, the real Illuminati and the Council of 13 that, that operates just in the United States of Babylon the Great. And, of course, it's a global organization. This is real stuff, folks. This isn't stuff that, you know, New World Order stuff and all that creepy stuff. And it isn't a bunch of stuff that people
people talk about it. This is real. It's very real. And the only reason we know how real it is is because people get born again. People who are members of the Illuminati that were born into the bloodline families. Now, those are the ones. The ones like Brother Robert Vandrius Mitchell that we had on the show. Those are the ones that, um, well, they're born into the bloodline. And when they're born into the blood, you know, families like the DuPonts, you know what I'm saying? You know, when you see these huge mega companies, that's why I call into question immediately. I had a red alert, red alert go off in my heart when I started to see Trump hiring all these, you know, billionaires from these mega corporations to come and work within the White House. Because you've got all these people blowing the whistle. I'm not going to name names. I mean, I, I will mention InfoWars because it is the, quint, you know, it is the Mac Daddy of all Mac Daddy uh, uh, conspiracy theorist sites. So I will call that one out for sure. I'm not going to mention any other ones, but there are others similar to that that have been spending the last several years pointing uh, to the fact that the, the global elite is, uh, you know, for, has formed this new world order, and this global elite uh, has, um, uh, is trying to, well, uh, um, you know, uh, create this one world government, you know, and then they point to the back of the dollar bill. They point to, uh, you know, all these things that are, you know, all this darkness that is hidden right up in front of our face. They write, they point to the writings of Carol Quigley, uh, you know, who happened to be a professor that, that was, uh, uh, you know, in, in the same college that, you know, studied uh, that uh, Bill Clinton went to, who Bill's, Bill Clinton's a Rhodes Scholar. All of them go to the Bohemian Grove. Uh, the evidence is just beyond overwhelming. Uh, you know, the, the stuff that Brother Nathan Leal did not have time to cover, and we're going to bring him back on. Uh, and who knows how the Lord is going to lead. But if you have researched his work, it's, it's, there's no question about it. You don't, you don't turn your penthouse suite uh, apartment complex at the top of Trump Towers into a, you know, an altar for the worship of pagan gods ignorantly. You know, that's the kind of thing. I mean, if you if you did that ignorantly, then boy, are you ignorant, you know, which I wouldn't be surprised about looking at some of the tweets. I don't know. But I'm just saying things are suspicious as suspicious can be. And we're going to touch upon that in the early part of the show tonight. But but I was very alarmed, you know, while I was trying to give people the benefit of the doubt, listening to all these people coming out on YouTube videos. And just like Brother Nathan was pointing out, saying he's King Cyrus, he's King this, that, and the other thing. And all these, you know, ecumenical leaders coming out and t telling everybody, just like they did when Sarah Palin was running with uh, Bill, you know, with, with uh, I'm sorry, with uh, McCain. I remember that. My whole family, who's all bat born again, speaking tongues, have various gifts of the Holy Spirit. The whole family was saying, yes, God has chosen Sarah Palin. God has chosen. In Sarah Palin, God has spoken. Well, look what happened. Now, is God in charge of every little thing? Does He count every hair on our head? Does He hear every beat of you know? Is He in control of every beat of our heart? Does not one sparrow fall to the ground outside of His Father's uh, outside of the Father's will, as Jesus said? Amen. The King's heart is in the hands of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, He turns it wherever He wishes. Proverbs twenty one one. Praise His holy name. But also, the iron yoke of Babylon was a judgment that was placed around the Jews for misbehaving. Okay, look at what's happening. Uh, Mike Pence came out and publicly stated unabashedly uh, came right out and said we the Trump administration and we are going to support uh, you know, LGBT homosexual rights in this country because they have rights this that and the other thing and I'm like I'm sorry why didn't I hear that during the campaign um, and then uh, this whole thing about, well, we're, you know, this is our chance to stop abortion. You got all these uh, evangelical leaders coming out. We're going to stop. You know, this is great. God is Trump. Trump is God's man. He's going to stop abortion. This, that. And I, oh, really? I, I'm pretty sure nothing has happened along that line. As a matter of fact, the feeble effort that was made to pull twenty six million dollars of funding, federal funding away from Planned Parenthood was a train wreck. In fact, Planned Parenthood said, Nana Booba, Nana Booba, it doesn't matter. We do abortions without federal funding anyway. It doesn't make any difference. Go ahead and pull your money if you want. And they didn't pull it. Because, of course, you had people coming out and saying, well, they do all these good things, too. You know, and that's how the devil works. Every single demonic de devil thing that there is out there. Look, 
How many people out there? Uh, I want to. I want to. I want to. I want to see. I want to hear a praise offering, a cheer from the audience, a praise offering to Jesus. How many people out there were deluged with Shriners Hospital uh, 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 videos and uh, uh, you know um, commercials all throughout the holidays? And some of them are even still going on today. Seeing them like four or five times an hour. How many people out there seen them? Huh? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, well, it, tell you what, folks, that is one of the things that breaks my heart more than anything is to see a Shriners uh, Hospital commercial. And I, man, I, oh, Lord Jesus, I cry and I want to give to those kids. But I know when I'm doing it, 97 percent of my money is going right into the hands of the devil. And I can't. And, and I hope that no other Christian does fall for that trick. Uh, and uh, it's, it, that is exactly how the devil works. All right, praise Jesus. So at least we're wise to his trickery, and, and we can act accordingly and, and, and funnel money and our contributions into places like, uh, 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 you, know, uh, 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 you know, Bibles for China or Bibles for the Middle East or for uh, Pipes International, Sammy Mwangi's operation that, thanks to our contributions, has been able to expand and touch. I mean, there, folks, they are bringing people to Jesus like crazy and feeding little kids. Uh, I wish I could give you the whole Pipes International story because it's amazing. I do recommend that you go to pipesinternational.org and read their history and hear about how that all started. It's amazing. Little kids coming, getting, losing their homes because of development and wars and terrorists and things like that in a Democratic Republic of the Congo and in, you know, right on, you know, Idri Island, right on the, you know, edge of Rwanda, where all that slaughter happened. As a matter of fact, one of the churches that Sammy uh, funnels money into to help uh, raise them up and build them out uh, is one of the, it's located right in the area that was in that movie Hotel Rwanda, where everybody was getting slaughtered. It was the movie about the Tutsis and the, um, I forget what the other group was, but anyway, you know, it was horrible. It was horrible. And then and the United Nations went in and pretended like they were doing something, which of course they were doing nothing, which is pretty much what they always do is nothing. The only time the United Nations ever did anything, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, with NATO help uh, that was meaningful was in the Bosnia and Herzegovina War, which is, you know, thank God for that. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, but anyway, um, it's just a great time to be alive. It's a great time to be able to use systems like PayPal to make sure that our contributions, because God, people have been taken to heaven. God is going to hold us accountable for not giving to the kingdom, not seeding, not tithing. We're going to be held accountable. You think you're, you're going to end up in a big, nice mansion and you haven't been tithing? <laughs> Forget it. You'll, you'll be lucky to make it anywhere. There are big mansions, there are smaller mansions, and there are apartments, and there are smaller places even. Further out into the outer darkness, the further away you get from the city of God, the smaller it gets. When the Bible says that, 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 that we will reap what we sow, oh boy, is it not kidding. As a matter of fact, there was a, uh, a pastor who was taken to heaven. Uh, I, I forget his name. I have it posted somewhere on Tribulation Now. I missed all the articles and everything. And um, he was taken to heaven. He did not think that he I believe he's a Korean pastor, but I'm not sure about that. But he, he honestly believed with all of his heart that because the money that was being given was given to his church, and because he was taking that money and funneling it into the church and the growth of the church, that that counted as seeding money into the kingdom. It counted as essentially his tithe. That's what he believed. Well, I guess he had a near-death experience and died, was taken to heaven— and God said, you got it all wrong. You don't understand. And the Lord took him around and showed him where he's going to end up living if he keeps living his life like that. Folks, when I, those kinds of things scare me to death. Heaven trips, especially the sobering ones, like the uh, Angelica Zambrano testimony of, uh, uh, called Prepare to Meet Your God. When there are people taken to heaven that, that, that come back and speak negatively about testimonies like Angelica Zambrano's testimony and say, well, God would never do that, I have a serious doubt in my heart whether or not that person was even taken to heaven. I was told by somebody, now granted, they didn't have proof, but they believed, and they were the daughter of, it was, it was in fact, it, I believe it was the daughter of Odin Hedrick. I, we had a four-hour conversation that Lucifer has made a fake heaven. 
Lucifer has created a fake version of heaven and that people are taken there. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I absolutely adore Odin Hetrick's vision, because every time he came – or not vision, but the 80-plus times that he was taken to heaven, because he came back every single time doubtful. Not doubtful, but uh, what's the word? Discerning. Yeah. And he came back, and he looked it up. He looked it up you know, like he was a good Berean, Acts 1711. He searched the Scripture daily to see if it was so. He would look up every little thing that he saw. He would you know, he'd go through, rifle through the Old Testament, rifle through metaphor. Oh, that's what it was. That's what it was. So he was confirming everything as best as he could. Now, I'm not saying that they weren't taking heaven, everybody. That, I don't know. We don't, the problem is we don't know. But what we do know is how dark the devil is how sick and twisted he is. We do know that he parades himself as a fake, false light. We do know, thanks to B.W. Melvin and his trip to hell and heaven, that there are levels of hell that are up so high that they appear to be light, which is, by the way, a revelation that was given by the Holy Spirit to Brother Peterson on the Peterson Chronicles on Saturday night. He said many times that there are, that, that Lucifer's, I, I forget, I probably Bork this all up, but Lucifer's darkness can become so dark that it appears as light or something. He puts it in a very interesting sort of a way. But, but uh, B.W. Melvin warned that a lot of these people that are having near-death experiences that are unbelievers, that are seeing angels of light and what looks to them like happy, loving, wonderful places, are actually very high levels of hell where the devil is masquerading uh, with his angels that can sh- sh- you know, shift and change into angels of light, light beings. And, of course, we have the testimony of Carolyn Hamlet on the show. The last, I think she said it on the last show, but not sure. We had her on the program two times. And um, but anyway, uh, and she said that, uh, you know, I don't know if she was in the pre- – yep, she saw – the devil. Now, in this particular manifestation, he was very, very tall and um, uh, very attractive and an, essentially an angel of light. Glorious, glorious being. Very, very attractive. And uh, Pittman, Howard Pittman, when he died, was taken to heaven. And he, in his movie Placebo, or not movie, but his uh, YouTube video, Placebo, where he gives his testimony about that. That's very sobering. Here's this guy's a Baptist pastor. A Baptist pastor, and God would not let him in the city of God, wouldn't let him in, because he was too into being a pastor. He liked being a pastor, kind of like the Pharisees and getting the best seats and all that kind of thing. Oh, that was Pittman's problem. God wouldn't let him inside the, the pearly gates, wouldn't let him into the city of God. But he was able to see the people walking in hell, walking in hell. He, he estimated that only 2%. This isn't even talking about the bride folks. He estimated that, this is back in 88, roughly, uh, he, he estimated back in 1988 that, that, that when he was looking at the crowds that were walking to hell and that were walking into heaven, and he compared the two together, his estimation was that only 2% were going to heaven of all the people that were dying that day that he saw walking, going down that hallway. Now, there's that saying that Carter Conlon says, in your last moments you realize that the feet coming down the hallway are not coming to take you to heaven. You know, anytime anybody out there says, oh, it's okay, it's all, you know, I just revert back to the itchy ears. I say, you know, the itchy ears doctrine. I was talking about this with Reverend Tracy Shulman. We like to get together, iron sharpens iron, that kind of thing, and uh, and share notes. And um, scripture, you know that that scripture with with it, you know about the itchy ears, you know uh, there will come a time. That scripture is uh, very revealing. It's really only made up. The, the key part that we were de- debating was is only made up of roughly two verses, which is four clauses of a single run-on sentence. And the only reason it's a run-on sentence is because Greek doesn't translate right into English, and you know the, the interpreters did the best they could. But uh, the um, uh, it, so starting at Second uh, Timothy verse three, I'm sorry, Second Timothy four verse three, it says, "For a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine." Well, that's the first of four clauses. So clause number one is, "For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine." 
That's the first clause. Second clause is, but according to their own desires, comma, okay, that's the second clause. Third clause is, because they have itching ears. That's the third clause. Comma, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Heap up. So, and then, and then it goes on to say in verse 4, and they will turn their ears away from the truth. They'll turn their ears away from the truth. That's the fifth clause, right? There's a semicolon separating verse 3 and 4. The reason why I'm doing this is because each one of the clauses of, of what I've read thus far is absolutely overflowing with important meaning. There is so much that can be derived from just these four or five clauses. How many people would read this as, as they say, Oh, for the time will come that they will not endure sound doctrine according to their desires because they have itchy ears. They will they heap up for themselves teachers and they'll turn their ears away from the truth. But they won't see. They will not spiritually discern the mysteries woven into the scripture. There is explicit meaning and there is implied meaning woven into each clause. For the time will come. Stop. There you go. There's one mystery. When the apostle uh, Paul was writing this, he wasn't talking about that day. He was talking about a time in the future. For the time will come. I wish I had like a reverb. For the time will come, will come, will come, will come. When they will not endure, not endure. What does that mean, not endure? Sound doctrine. Not endure means they, they walk out. They don't want nothing to do with your church. They don't want to hang out with you. You're a downer. You're, you're making me feel bad. You're telling me that I could go to hell? I believe in Jesus. Oh. He's your fire insurance, is he? Have you read the Bible? Well, I know John 3.16. I know what that says. Oh. Know what Luke 12.48 says? To whom much has been given, much will be required. And you haven't opened the Bible on your dining room table in five years? Have you seen the Chinese people crying when they're receiving their Bibles? And that one video that's out there? So powerful. <sighs> wow. They will not endure sound doctrine. They will leave churches that preach holiness and righteousness. They will leave them. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. What are these desires that they have? What are they? What are the desires that they have that would cause them to refuse to endure sound doctrine? There's only one thing. Sin. When the scripture says that he who is friends with the earth is at enmity with God in the first, in, you know, James 1, uh, chapter 1, read it, very important. I don't have, the, I don't know the exact, uh, it, it might be James 4. Use your electronic Bible to find it. Just type in uh, friends and enmity in New King James. He who is fr at friends with the earth is at enmity with God. That's hatred with God. So basically, you can easily derive that these people who have these according to their own desires, which are obviously earthly and unrighteous, they are going to go away. They're going to leave you. They're not going to endure sound doctrine. They're going to flip the off button. They're going to head out. One time there was a listener to a radio program that we did that called up one of our guests and complained to him, started out with an email. I don't know if he called him up or it was all done over the email. Now that I think about it, it might not have been a direct phone call. It was probably done by email. And complained, those people in tribulation now are a bunch of heretics. They're telling people that only 2% are going to make it in heaven. 
I'm serious, actually sent a lengthy complaint email to one of the guests that we had on the show. Pretty well-known, fam- famous person uh, in the ranks of the end time sort of people, if you will. Pretty well-known. <laughs> he sent me an email. He's like, who is this? <laughs> People don't understand the bride. See, what, what, what Pastor Pittman saw was 2% of all of humanity. Imagine what percent of those going to heaven that would have been of the 2 percentile, what percent of those actually would have been qualified or chosen to be part of the bride, the wise virgins. One out of 10? One out of 100? So when people listen to this program and they hear me preaching what needs to be preached now more than anything to save people from being cast into the Great Tribulation and suffering the horrible hour of trial, which is really three and a half years, 42 months, times, times, or half a time, 3.5 years, 1260 days, the Great Tribulation. If we understood the threats to the kingdom, if we knew what those threats were and we could prioritize our efforts to reduce the casualties, the casualties of spiritual war, we would want to get as many people as part of the bride and the final harvest as we possibly can. And you don't do that by telling everybody itchy ears stuff. When you tell people itchy ears stuff and you go and you tell everybody and you're popular and everybody loves you and you're just, you're you're, you're getting invited on all the radio shows and everything's just wonderful for you. The better things are going for you in your ministry, the more you better take a second look at what it is you're saying. Because if you're doing real good and getting invited on all these TV shows, I hope you hear this, whoever needs to hear this, or different radio shows, uh, whoever he needs to hear this, or your numbers are taking off on YouTube, whoever needs to hear this, in the name of Jesus, I pray for your soul and the soul of those who are you are giving. Well, you're not giving them what they need. You're not feeding the sheep. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? If you love me, feed my sheep. And in the book of Ezekiel, when God is judging the shepherds, he warns, he warns the shepherds. He says, I am against the shepherds. You feed yourself with your PayPal button. You feed yourself with your PayPal button on your website and your YouTube channel. You feed yourself and you clothe yourself, but you don't feed my sheep. Read Ezekiel 34, folks. I will never take a tithe or an offering. I told the Lord, I said, I told him, Father, as long as you can keep me gainfully employed and I can pay for the expenses that are associated with doing this radio show, I will do it until the day I die or the power goes out. But I, don't, I told the Father straight up, I, I will be here. I will be here no matter what. But, Father, <laughs> I'm not taking tithes. I hope he doesn't send an angel and make me a liar. <laughs> Be like, oh no, I repent. But I don't. I, I know. I, I've had this conversation with the Lord. I don't want nothing to do with it. I praise him all the time for my job. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And he takes care of me. And I, I cannot imagine being any more blessed, whether it be five listeners or thousands of listeners worldwide, any more blessed to being able to help somebody. In whatever capacity it is that we can help them. Praise God. But you know what? We're not going to give you itchy ears doctrine. We're not going to let you go to hell. And we're certainly, and, and you might say, well, well, wait a minute. You know, first you're talking about the bride, and then you're talking about the tribulation saints getting cast into the great tribulation. Which is it, Johnny? Well, let me be perfectly clear. A lot of the people who think they're Christians who probably at this time fit into the classification of foolish virgins, who on no uncertain terms are at this time going to get cast into the Great Tribulation because of their current choices, probably won't make it into heaven. There's only a select number of people that are going to make it. And how do we know this stuff? Well, we listen to the prophecies. We, even, even the Tommy Hicks vision. Even in the Tommy Hicks vision of 1961, 
there's a very sobering scene in that vision where uh, the, the where the person who received the vision was lamenting because many of the people he believed were going to be great uh, workers for the Lord Jesus in the end times were were stepping back away from Jesus' hands as he was reaching out to them as the opportunity was being placed before them to serve God uh, in a miraculous and awesome supernatural capacity for the final harvest, they faded back into darkness. They were unwilling to make the sacrifice. I would imagine they ran downstairs into their basement with their guns and beanie weenies. Those are not, those are not people that have a very high level of likelihood of making it into heaven. He who seeks to save his life will lose it. It's not talking about earthly life. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And you're like, well, that you know that doesn't. Well, here's the thing. And I'm gonna I'm gonna try on Wednesday's show, since as far as I know, we're not gonna have any extra guests like Sammy and, and or others joining us on the Wednesday show. I'm gonna read to you a a teaching that I put together. So if you if you're curious about how this works, matter of fact. Matter of fact, let me let me take a look. I may just go ahead and read it right now because I have it right here. I'm going to because we're on the subject, and I feel led so. And then we're going to go ahead and blast into the the headlines and uh, plow through it pretty quick because uh, we got Sammy joining us in 30 minutes or so, and he's so patient. He's awesome. Praise God, and so is Sister Terry. What a blessing! This is going to be a great message, folks. Tonight is going to be a great message. All right. This is a teaching that I put together. Now, I shared this, you know, I like to share this, you know, I shared this, I wrote this up for a, for a listener, because they were, we have a tendency, and this is a human thing, it's wired into our DNA, we have, this is, theologians, and, you know, yes, I am picking on theology, because I have disdain for those who believe they understand things by virtue of having gone to a Rockefeller Foundation funded, John Burke Society funded Bible college and told what to think and then come out and teach itchy ears doctrine and invest in large parking lots because they're leading the sheep to hell unwittingly. And I pray for them in tears for God to have mercy upon them because I don't want anybody to go to hell. And I don't want to think about it right now because I'll just start bawling on the show. I want to be able to breathe. Praise you, Jesus. Now, this is my little teaching that I put together. This is very complicated. Everybody thinks that God is analog. But it says no shadow of turning. Well, that's because this analog nature of our Father is very much like us. We are commanded to let God handle the vengeance. We don't do the vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We heap coals of love upon the heads of our enemies. We feed our hungry enemies. Uh, folks, it's what we're commanded because that's, it's, we have to be like Jesus. We are to be like Jesus. The Father will handle all the other stuff. So, so okay, let me just share this with you. This is, um, it's deep. And I would submit that the vast majority of listeners to this program, just based on, I don't know, Raw averages, running averages in numbers, and what what the what the statisticians refer to as organic listens. Those numbers, I would submit that probably the majority of people won't get it. But I pray in Jesus' name, Father God, that you will open the eyes, the ears, and the spiritual acuity of every single listener that they understand this, because this is, as you know, Father, you know that that this is a, a huge mystery of the Bible that very few understand. When I gave this to Sister Tracy Shulman, she was like on the phone with me like Shazam, because this is exciting. And she, she knew about this, but she never saw it lined up with the scriptures to support it. The thing is that you can't – when you graduate out of the realm of theological understanding of the Bible and you move into spiritual understanding of the Bible, what happens is – at a spiritual level, the scriptures weave a tapestry of supernatural understanding that overlays the entire Bible. And you know things. You spiritually know things like Ezekiel 34 isn't talking about only Israel. It's also talking about the preachers of 2017. See? But that's a spiritual thing. And when you get to that 
level where you are connecting the dots from scriptures all the way from, you know, Deuteronomy to Revelation, and you're seeing this tapestry of, of mystery unraveling before your heart, and you're like, oh, wow. So I'm just going to share this with you. It is in the show notes, and the show notes are posted at tribulation-now.org, tribulation-now.org. Or if you prefer, tribulationnow.com, no dash. Tribulationnow, one word, dot com, no dash. You go to the show notes at the bottom of the black banner, and you can look it up in the show notes. And I've entitled it, Fear of God and the Power of the Saints. This is very, this is not milk, folks. This is serious meat. And this is not lofty. It's right out of the Bible. Okay, quote. We know that when we are told to fear God, this is fear of being cast into hell. Real fear. Because Jesus says so right here. This is vital to grasp, as many theologians think, that this is what they call a reverent fear. To try to reconcile fearing God and loving God at the same time, because they don't relate to it. They don't understand it. By the way, folks, this is also why... There are thousands of denominations that don't believe in speaking in tongues. They're called cessationists. The reason is because they, they didn't have it happen to them. So they figured, well, if it didn't happen to me, then, it, then, then it's got to be demonic, demonic. If it didn't happen to me, and I'm a very godly guy, I'm the greatest Pharisee of them all, then by golly, it's got to be a lie, and it's the devil. That's what they think. So they create entire... Huge groups and denominations of Christians that are cessationists and believe that the Holy Spirit uh, stopped causing miracles to happen because that which is perfect came when the Bible was created. They actually point to the Bible as that which is perfect has come. And anybody who understands the Bible at all knows the Bible, translations are less than perfect. The Word of God is inerrant. But the translations are not correct. That's why we got to dig, dig, dig. Hallelujah. All right, so it goes on and it says, because, because they don't understand fearing God and loving him at the same time. Now, the reason why this was an easy concept for me to get was because my father was a very strict disciplinarian, and I loved him, but I feared him. And I cried so hard. There's a story about Sigmund Freud. Look it up on the internet. It's called I, you know, I don't know for lack of a better term. I call it the puppy story, where he tested a litter of puppies. Took four of the puppies. He had a duplex. He put or he built a wall. I forget which it was. I think it was like a duplex. But anyway, and and on one side he had four puppies that he disciplined very strictly. Spare the rod, spoil the child, beat them as soon as they did something wrong. Beat, 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 spank, 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 chase them, chase them, chase them. And the four puppies on the other side, he let them run all over the place and do whatever they want. Never beat them. Never spanked them. Never did anything. The four puppies that he let do whatever they wanted to do all died early. They died young. They chased cars down the road, got run over by trucks, got lost, ran away. And the puppies that he was a strict disciplinarian with loved him deeply. Many of you know lived with him the whole time that they were alive, followed him around, laid at his feet like my puppy dog is right now here in the Golden EIB studios at Tampa, Florida. All right. When the Bible says spare the rod, spoil the child, folks, it's not optional. All right. So anyway, it says Matthew ten twenty eight. So here's the proof that it's not a reverent fear. People like to make up terms. Oh, they got to give God an excuse for being God. You see. So it's a reverent fear. It's a special kind of fear that we have. No, it's fear of hell. How do we know this? Because Jesus said so in Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him, God, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I think that's pretty clear. Doesn't sound like reverent fear to me. 
If God is going to, if, if Jesus is threatening and telling me to fear God because he might throw me into hell, and I know what hell, hell is about, and I've watched you know, Bill Weiss' 23 Minutes of Hell, and I have a clue what it is and how horrible it is, I'm, a, I'm afraid of it. I'm steering my car all the way to the other side of the guardrail. I'm not even going to go near it. And that's exactly what the Father wants you to do. Read on. I, I wrote on. Jesus is being very clear and holding up the promise of hell as the penalty for those who do not fear him and understand the penalty of their choices. Theologians are forever trying to understand how we are able to truly fear God but to also love him. I'm very fortunate because this is precisely the relationship that I had with my earthly father, who I love dearly. Very, very few people on earth today understand this. Then I go on to say, now here below, you see that if, if, big capital letter if, we judge or examine ourselves and avoid uh, and our behavior, if we examine ourselves and our behavior and repent daily, adjusting our course, we might avoid actually being chastened by God. Unfortunately, not everyone responds to the chastening. Those who cross that undefined line, it's undefined, where God says, no more chances, and allows the willful sinner to perish, die, then at God's discretion he may be cast into hell. 1 Corinthians 11.31 For if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we judge ourselves, we are chastened by, um, uh, again, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. So check it out. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. So God wouldn't judge us. But, the big but, when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. That we may not be condemned with the world. And you go like, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 look at that. It says that we may not be condemned with the world. However, did you respond to the chastening properly? Correct your course, overcome your sin, be an overcomer, and become obedient, and love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. Did you make the appropriate adjustment? Did you respond to that spanking, or did you go back out and start fornicating again? Did you even recognize it was a chastening by God? Or did some preacher tell you it was the devil? It goes on, here we see proof of this, whereby it is made crystal clear that if we continue in willful and habitual sin, we can expect, quote, a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, e.g. hell. Hebrews 10, 26, where if we sin willfully after we, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Hell. And I write on, he, here Jesus is personally blotting otherwise good Christians out of the book of life for failing to be obedient and overcoming temptation. Remember, this is Jesus doing it. Not the Father, Jesus. Revelation 3.10, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot his name from the book of life. Well, what does that tell you? Those who don't overcome will not be clothed in white garments, and Jesus will blot their name from the book of life. I go on to say, and now most importantly, here we see Jesus explaining that the more we have learned about our obligations, the more accountable we will be held here on earth for our choices. Choosing not to read the dusty Bible on your bookshelf is no excuse. Luke 12, and the servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes, which includes getting cast in hell, by the way. Verse 48, but he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. Ah, so those people in China who don't have Bibles? But are doing the best they can with what little they know, they will be beaten with few stripes. They will be given a break. 
the little pygmy boys and girls and moms and dads that, that Sammy Mwangi is, is feeding and bringing out of the jungle that were cast out of the jungle by the, the terrorists and all the horrible things. That, uh, yes, they're going to heaven. Because they don't live in the United States of Babylon the Great with a church on every street corner and five or six Bibles sitting around their house gathering dust. And then it goes on, for everyone to whom much is given, this is Luke 12, verse 48, for everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required. It doesn't say much will be optional. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask all the more. Who are they? Hmm. And then it goes on, and now here is another fluid dynamic that comes into play. Our prayers. Here you see that the true, holy, and righteous saints of God who fear him have special prayer powers uh, for sinners to save their souls through God answering their prayers. Job 22.30, he, our Father, will even deliver from hell the one for whom you intercede, who is not innocent. Yes, he will be delivered through the cleanness of your hands. Now, I embellish that a little bit to help you out. It's a capital H-E. He will even deliver. That's talking about God. He will even deliver the one who is not innocent. Yes, he will be delivered through the cleanness of your hands. 1 John 5.16. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, the saint will, will ask, and he, God, will give him life for those who commit sins not leading to death. Right there, it comes right out and says... If we pray for them, God will save their souls. Now, when it's going to happen, we don't know. We don't want to get ourselves, you know, be in our bonnet and start crying and doubting God. We need to keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, and have faith and believe that God is going to, because he will, save their souls. But there, there is proof. 1 John 5, 16 proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that if it says right there, if anyone, if anyone, he's talking about the saints, sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, which, by the way, is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, or um, blasphemy is the Holy Spirit is one of them for sure. There are a couple. Oh, yeah. And, of course, unforgiveness. If anyone sees a brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he, the saint, will ask and he, God, will give him life for those who commit sins not leading to death. Hello? How come nobody ever teaches this in the church? First John 5, 16. You know why? Because they think everybody's going to heaven. John twenty twenty three. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Mystery verses about the power that God has given us. Don't even get me going on, 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 on Psalms. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. 34.15, Psalms 34.9. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. No, oh, it's a reverent fear. No, it's not. Psalm 34.17. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves the souls of such who have contrite spirits. Psalm 18.20, listen to this. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He rewarded me. Psalm 18.20. But these are reserved for that. This is reserved probably for the 2% or less than that, even the bride I would submit. This is talking about the true, righteous, and holy saints who fear God. Praise Jesus. Jose? Brother, brother, I go back to Jesus. I go back to Jesus. One of the things that is amazing. amazing. That is amazing. Here's a man who was Here's... relatively unknown to the age of 30. And he starts his public ministry. And three years later, he's, he's crucified, he's killed for the things that he said. And so sometimes I, I sit here and I ponder, what must a man say to go from obscurity to being killed? What kind of words must you say to incite the powers that be to deem you so dangerous for people to hate you so much that in three short years, they kill you, they crucify you. And so when I look at some of these big churches, mega churches with um, a lot of folks and a lot of... Uh, 
pomp and circumstance and a lot of happiness. I can't help but to think, um, you know, I don't, I don't read that in the Bible. I read of a man who, whose speech was so powerful that he got killed for the things that he says in three years. For example, when after he always had people leaving. So people came, people left. And in one occasion, the multitudes left him. And so he looks at the apostles and says, are you guys leaving too? And, and one of them says, for no, um, master, for we know that you have the words that give eternal life. But he looked at them and said, were you guys leaving too? That's how powerful his words were. One time he was at a synagogue and he says, you got to eat from my flesh and drink of my blood. And he caused a stir in the synagogue and people were moaning, oh, this teaching is too hard. Who can act on it? So each years bring discomfort and, 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 and bring the, a certain level of joy and happiness and everything's going to be okay. And some of the gospel is about love and it's about faith and it's about beautiful things. But to get there, the majority of the gospel is about check yourself out and stop sinning and stop doing the things that displease the father. Stop doing the things that displease your brother. Love thy father, love thy neighbor. And all throughout his ministry, those three years, his words were so impactful. His words were so um, hard that he was killed for it. And we don't, we don't see that all all, I think all the martyrs except one were martyred, stoned, crucified upside down. John ended up in the island of Patmos as a recluse. This is the reality for those who preach the real gospel. Those is the reality for those who speak the truth of God. Not the itching ears and the happy messages all the time and the band and the, and the, you know, the children and, and all these beautiful things that, that are, you know, they're okay, but they're not the real gospel. The real gospel is hard. The real gospel is harsh. The real gospel demands that we inspect ourselves and our hearts. The real gospel demands that we obey the teachings. Those who love me shall obey my commandments. Am I obeying God's commandments? Am I doing what Jesus told me to do? And that's something that is is in everybody that calls themselves Christian. Should be that sense of, am I doing what's right? Am I doing what God is required? Do I, am I going to get into heaven? Because, brother, times are short. And there's really no time to dilly-dally about salvation. There's no time to sit around and wait for, for another sermon and wait for another, you know, big thing at church and a big gathering. Let's all get together and sing kumbaya. There's no time for that anymore. The times are here. And we must inspect ourselves. Lord, search me, O oh God. Search me, O oh God, and tell me. If you find anything displeasing, it's a, it's a very, the real Christian walk is a very hard thing. And, and, and if you're not hurting in some way or another, you're not really doing it right. Back to you, Johnny. We were just, we were just talking about this before the show started. Remember that I was, I, we were, you know, Jose and I were just talking to here's So here, you know, here's the rubber meets the road. Okay. It's what I call pl- applied a Christianity, applied Christianity. It's one thing to talk about it. It's one thing to point to the scriptures. I mean, one of the most convicting scriptures of all in, in this line of uh, thought is Matthew ten thirty four through 39, where Jesus says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a, but a, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, daughter against his mother, daughter-in-law against his mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. See, we we really don't get it. I, I mean, I know I didn't for, what, you know, 50 years? <laughs> but anyway, Jose and I were talking, you know, applied Christianity. We were talking about it on the phone. I was like, Jose, you know what? We need to go to a nice – we need to get out of the house. We need to go – you know, because you know what? We were talking about, well, fellowship, because we don't want to fellowship with the church, because they will look at us like we're crazy. There's nothing refreshing, edifying, joyous, blessing, positive, loving, encouraging about going out with believers that believe in apostate teachings and think they're, be, they're 
aberrant sinful behaviors are okay. And then they ask you how you feel, probably because you're sitting in the corner of the table at, 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 you know, at the restaurant with tears in your eyes. And you, you can barely vocalize how horrified you are that you're sitting amongst these people that call themselves Christians. And that's what we all face. And so I was saying I was saying to Jose, I said, Jose, you need to take some time, man. We'll come down here. We'll find ourselves a nice seafood restaurant on the Gulf of Mexico. We'll go over and enjoy the sunset. And we, you know, because, you know, because that's the only, if we are blessed to know anybody, and I get emails all the time from people, but they're Sister Nancy. Sister Nancy's husband is a preacher of a church, and they got a whole church and everything, and she can't, she can't, she knows. She feels she is surrounded by people constantly uh, in all of the works and loving, awesome works that she does for the kingdom, uh, working with her husband, working with the people in the church. But she has to bite her tongue. She can't go out and talk about Jesus and the things that she knows. It's the most lonely place on earth. That's why I was like saying, Jose, you know what? It's you and me, man. (laughs) Because, you know, what? we're not going to find Others that are thinking like us. And we are we are condemned to being lonely. Go for it. Jose? So so it you sit down with a with a with a, at least for me, and, and this has happened to me before. Sit down with a group of, of little sick Christians and the conversation starts and somebody talks about their retirement fund. And I'm thinking, you know, I probably will not get to retirement. <laughs> the Lord is probably going to be here a little earlier than retirement. And somebody talks about, well, college. I'm going to go get my master's degree or my PhD. And I'm here thinking, I don't think you're going to finish college. And so on and so on. In reality, you know you got to a point of loving the Lord. Well, all the topic of conversation you have is really Jesus. When you know you really care to talk about, the only thing that matters anymore in life is Jesus, and God and the Holy Spirit, and his things. And most of the world does not fall into that because most of the world just wants to live their lives. But the problem is, is that there is no life to be lived anymore, either because sin robs all the joy out of life or because simply there isn't any more time to live a long prosperous life anymore whatever institution whatever long term activity whatever long term plans in my opinion they are useless because he is going to come soon and not only that that the only long term plan that I have is Jesus my retirement plan is Jesus my old age is Jesus. My everything is Jesus. So I'm a pretty boring conversationalist because I don't really, don't really care to talk about 401ks, the Dallas Cowboys, or what's happening in the entertainment industry because none of that interests me. And it's hard to find people, believe it or not, it's hard to find people like that. The church that I attend to, um, it's, it's small. And people come and people go. And my pastor is a sensational pastor. My pastor talks about <laughs> obeying God and not going to hell. And people come, they sit down one to three weeks, and they leave. Because it's, it's hard. It's a hard teaching, just like the teachings of Jesus. The teachings of Jesus are hard. If your pastor follows Jesus, then his teachings are going to be hard. If you follow Jesus, the things that you can talk about are going to be hard. And it doesn't get any better until we go home. And that's what I'm here. I'm here to one day make it so I can go home and really live, maybe for the first time. Back to you, Johnny. Yeah, amen. Praise God. And you know what? If you do have somebody that you can hang out with, you know, or or an understanding spouse, which is rare, uh, but, you know, if you do, there are – it's not – you know, you don't want to, like, go out. Enjoy the beauty that God has given us, you know. Go out. Uh, hike, do some hiking, get out of the house, go hang out by a lake and say, wow, Lord, praise your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, but, you know, the tricky part is to be able to have company that, you know, doesn't revile you and, and exclude you and 
<laughs> roll their eyes and go, oh, no, because you'll never get invited again. That is for sure. Uh, been there, done that, folks, and I'm sure most of us have. And, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of us are experiencing that even through our spouses and our husbands and wives and children and, and all that kind of stuff. But that, that is exactly what Jesus warned us would happen. Praise God. All right, let's go ahead and move through uh, the headlines, which are powerful, as always. And, um, uh, and uh, then we're going to be bringing on Brother Sammy, and then we're going to roll over to... I can stop that now because I got this really cool soundboard. I can stop it midstream. See, if I was doing this with uh, with the Blog Talk Radio stuff, I couldn't stop it like that. I hit the button too soon. <laughs> but anyway, praise Jesus, Brother Sammy and, and, and Sister Terry, because if we run a little bit over getting this news out to you, no problem at all. Uh, uh, I love it when we uh, have guests on that are regular that uh, know how we operate and, and how we're overloaded with just – we get the Holy Spirit moves. Sometimes I start out and I'm just like, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that. I want to get the news out. I want to get the news out. And then the hair starts to stand up on my arm. And it's like the Lord is saying, you need to talk about it. And then what am I going to do? Say, no, Lord, I have to talk about Donald Trump. <laughs> no, I'm going to talk about Jesus. Hallelujah. Here we go. All right, listen to this headline. Uh, this is all over the place, folks. It's not just CNN. I know there, there are a lot of people out there. You know, it, it, absolutely, the division of the devil is, is, is humongous. Fox News is everything they do. They twist their headlines around. I laugh. I sit there and read the headlines, and I'm, I'm laughing so hard because I know what's actually going on. And then I watch how Fox twists them to say, oh, it's okay. You know, it's all right. Everything's going to be just fine. Trump is great. Trump is wonderful. And then you go over to CNN. Actually, I never thought in a million years that I would think the CNN was more level-headed and accurate than Fox, but absolutely uh, it is. Right now, if you want to take a pick, uh, now I'm not saying that CNN isn't weird and mind controlish like all the rest of them. They all are. They're all sick and twisted. Don't trust the darn one of them. Always check your P's and Q's and go out and do your research. Amen. Praise God. But everybody's off kilter right now. Everybody is off kilter. The, th- the situation is very messed up. Like I was talking about at the beginning of the program, what you've got all these people like InfoWars and stuff like that for the last 10 years have been telling the entire world that the elites are our enemy. And what do we got running the government? Elites. What, what do we know about the elites, that the, the billionaire CEOs of these major corporations, almost all of them are members of the Illuminati, and they're almost all for sure members of the Masonic Lodge. But no, we're going to forgive them because they understand our plight. They know about the New World Order. So they're going to break down. They promise to get rid of NAFTA and, make, and put up walls and, and make America great again. And it's okay if they're elites. It's okay if they're Masonic. It's okay if they're part of the Illuminati because they're going to make America great again. I think that would be a big fat. All right. Anyway, listen to this headline. I knew this one was coming. Netanyahu's honeymoon with Trump ends abruptly. By the way, this is also repeated on articles, not this specific article. It's not reprinted, but it's another version of this article is out on uh, Israeli News, uh, Jerusalem Post. So it's all over. The, all, all over. Netanyahu's honeymoon uh, with Trump ends abruptly. And this is from the Jerusalem Post of CNN. Uh, this was supposed to be uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's victory lap. After a combined 10 years leading the government, he finally had a Republican president in the White House. Thank you, ecumen- thank you, thank you, not ecumenical. A lot of them are ecumenical, which is a shame. But uh, thank you, evangelical leaders of the United States of Babylon the Great, for telling everybody that he's Trump, God's choice. Okay, finally had a Republican president in the White House with a Republican House and Senate to boot. It should have been the perfect match for Netanyahu's right wing coalition. The prime minister would be free of the condemnation of construction in the West Bank and East Jerusalem settlements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That former Barack Obama was uh, was, you know, bringing down and all this stuff. And guess what? Trump sent in an, an envoy into Israel to say, stop building out the settlements, stop building out the settlements. And now uh, they, they got the Arab League putting together a, a two-state solution peace deal to jam down Netanyahu's throat. So let's do a quick review, shall we? 
Praise Jesus. Let's review Trump's track plan on all the things that are godly items. Abortion, an attempt to stop Planned Parenthood from performing abortions, uh, a letter sent from the White House, and a proposal sent to Planned Parenthood ended up in a big fail. Stop cheering. That's a buzzer. Yeah, that's better. Who was that in the audience that cheered? <laughs> okay, embassy move. Embassy move to Jerusalem. Fail. Israeli settlements. Fail. Two-state solution. Fail. And last but not least, Thank you, Mr. Michael Pence. LGBT, LMNOP, gay and homosexual rights. Fail. Every single thing that our Heavenly Father would care about is a fail. Jose? Brother Jose, do you have your mic mute on? Brother Jose, are you there? Hello. Is the wrong button. <laughs> ah, you got it nailed. I get to buzz you. All right, I'm buzzing Jose. Oh yeah, you know what? You know what? I gotta play this too. <laughs> Jose, no. Okay, that's all right. You're allowed to make a mistake. I do it all the time. So join the party. <laughs> With all the humility can muster, I would like to remind every world leader that God has made a promise. This is the same God that created heaven and earth, the same God that created time itself, the same God that wiped the Egyptians and Sodom and Gomorrah. That same God promised that I will bless those who bless you, Israel, and whomever curses you, I will curse, and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Those are very heavy promises that we ought to keep in mind every time we deal with Israel. Back to you, Johnny. Yeah, praise God. And I see you there, Brother Sammy. Hang in there for me. As always, we're running behind schedule, so don't worry about it. It's all good. Hallelujah. All right. And all right. Good. Queued up. And now we're going to go into the main news stream because I can roll over some of those other reports to the next show. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Here we go. All right, as in the days of Noah. All right, praise God. So, oh, and there is one more thing that uh, is applicable to what I'm about to share with you, and it's this. Strange sounds from the sky in Sweden recorded on video on March 8, 2017. And it even says they're back in the article. And here's a recording of what they recorded uh, in this particular town in Sweden. And indeed, they're back. Okay, like, that was, like, sounds coming down from the sky and the person with the cell phone recording it in disbelief. They're back. They're here. 
Headline, Judge O'Kay's petition for America's first genderless person. Portland student has become the first American's first to, uh, American to gain legislative support to become genderless. Isn't that special? Alien mothership, huge circular shadow, floats past the ISS International Space Station in a remarkable, Na- in remarkable NASA footage, which indeed it is. Matter of fact, uh, these headlines are now reaching relatively well-known news outlets. This is no longer, you know, uh, creepy, weird places that nobody ever goes on the Internet. Listen to this. This is from the International Business Times. Quote, are aliens real? Researchers discover that forms can travel across planets in Goldilocks zone. In a Goldilocks zone, it's talking about a report from Cornell University. Uh, and uh, it says the system of exoplanets uh, dubbed TRAPPIST-1 by NASA after the federal agency discovered that the region in late February includes seven exoplanets and one of the most likely possibilities for extraterrestrial lives and life, and life and it goes on, blah, 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 and talks about it. I mean, this is international business times. Uh, two UFOs spotted flying by the International Space Station in this recent footage. Um, it's it, it just one right after the other. Listen to this. Uh, sightings of mysterious triangle UFOs are on the rise. The sensation of the triangle UFO has intensified uh, in the U.S. after two more strange craft were allegedly caught on video camera. And I wish we had time to read every single bit of it, but we don't. Uh, we'll go on. Uh, it just, the list just goes on and on and on. Praise God. All right, listen to this. Uh, this is from the Connecticut Conservative Tribune. Girl tells doctor that she's being tracked. He thinks she's nuts until the chilling x-ray comes out and he sees the, you know, creepy, weird tracking chip and all that kind of weirdness. Uh, uh, then New York Post. New York Post. Listen to this. Massive anomaly lurks beneath the ice in Antarctica. Folks, uh, it just the list just goes on and on. Uh, Times of Israel, Jerusalem to host Israel's main gay pride parade. Anybody say Gog and Magog? Gog and Magog? Hmm? Has the iron yoke of Babylon been lifted off of them? Folks, it's coming. Judgment is coming on all of these nations. Praise Jesus. This is uh, from Signs in the Sun and the Moon and the Star Seas Roaring. Experts predict 7,000 more Siberian holes about to open soon. And this is talking about those really creepy, super creepy, weird, uh, gigantic uh, holes in Siberia that yeah, they look like some giant drill was drilled down into the ground. And the, the, the experts can't even tell. They even have one person uh, suggesting that it's a doorway to the underworld in this particular report. And they're saying that 7,000 more are about to appear based upon studies and uh, areas of the ground and the, and the uh, frozen tundra and such that has uh, excessive amounts of methane uh, bubbles and such underneath it, because they think that that's what's causing it. I have another belief. <laughs> Solar slump. The sun has been blank for two weeks. And by the way, that's a warning. That's a warning. When yellow dwarfs stop having sunspots, they tend to explode in a fury of ugly they sputter and spurt. Anyway, uh, listen to this. 500,000 people affected, 11 dead. Rains, left, uh, uh, rains have left reservoirs overflowing in Angola and after a crippling drought. And it goes on to say California, Zimbabwe, New Zealand, Madagascar, Nambia, uh, Namibia, sorry about that, Angola. All of them, droughts, wiped out, wiped out. Peru disaster, up, 84 dead, 20 missing, over 80,000 people injured and 150,000 properties damaged. Dredge, torrential, it's, it's apocalyptic weather. It's unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. Praise God. Now let's go ahead and do New World Order war, uh, violence, insanity, upheaval, and rumors of wars. Cincinnati nightclub shooting. One killed, 14 injured. That just happened the other day. Listen to this. Las Vegas tourists flee in terror as the world-famous Bellagio Hotel is put on lockdown after a gang of armed robbers, including one in a pig mask, opened fire in a Rolex store raid. And it goes on to explain a whole bunch of other awful stuff that happened. Listen to this. An unidentified assailant shoots seven people in the United States of St. Louis, killing one. It's just happened. It's just one thing after another, folks. And Europe is just getting potty slammed. Jerusalem Post, Assad to Israel. We have a right to defend our border. So basically he's shaking Putin's hand. Uh, this is from the Jerusalem Post. I'm making it very clear that we're going to attack. 
It says uh, Times of Israel, another uh, report. Israel plans mass evacuations if war erupts again. And they're pointing out Hamas and, and Hezbollah. Of course, Hezbollah would be coming from the east. Hamas would be coming from the west, uh, from Gaza. And Hezbollah would be funded by Iran. Well, that's why Israel is bombing the truck on, you know, in the storage warehouses nearby Damascus and Palmyra and all that with their jets because they believe that Hezbollah is bringing in their equipment that way and there's been threats to take out the Golan Heights. Folks, come on. It is all happening while we're all sitting around watching oh, the health care bill didn't pass. Hmm, wonder why. Maxine Waters, Representative Maxine Waters, veils a th- puts out a veiled threat to say, get ready for impeachment. We're going to impeach Trump. There's a whole bunch of people who think that they're going to you know, do the whole you know, Russian collusion deal. And uh, the, Gor- uh, the Gorsuch guy that uh, Trump picked to be on the, uh, uh, on the uh, 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 Supreme Court came out and told Lindsey William on no uncertain terms. He said, quote, if Trump asked me to overturn Road versus Wade, I would have walked out the door. Now, was he lying? Doesn't sound very promising. For those who have been touting that as a win, win, win for Donald Trump. Emergency alert. Elites are trying to kill Trump. Elites are trying to kill Trump. Of course, I've never seen the insanity coming out of InfoWars as it is right now. It's just I used to really love that operation and Wow, what a mess we're in. Iraqi monitor, 415,000 refugees replaced since the start of Mosul, the Mosul campaign, or displaced, displaced, 415,000 people, 55,000, I was wrong, I said 45 the last time, no, it was 55,000 children killed in Syria. You know where the really good Christians are? They're over in those dangerous places, just like our brother Sammy Mwangi has been going into lately. Praise Jesus for their work. God bless them. Uh, And, um, you know, uh, let's go ahead and bring him on the program right now. Here we go. Praise Jesus. Brother Sammy, are you there? Hey, man, I'm here, John. Bon asifiwe. Asifiwe, yes, sir. Huh? Hey, man, oh, you said it correct. Uh. You said it correct. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that was help with that uh, means... Pastor Tracy Shelman. She helped me out with that one. So. Oh, anyway, wow. Praise... That means Jesus be praised. Amen. Amen. Praise Jesus. So um, so go ahead and tell us what's going on. I got the uh, report that uh, additional work in Pakistan has been leading people to Jesus. And anyway, I'm going to pass the mic over to you so you can share with people what's going on. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, John, once again. Um, it's always an honor to give updates. A lot of people who do support us tell me that they hear my, uh, my updates on the tribulation now. So this is always um, a God uh, divine purpose. Uh, given to us. So I want to say that, uh, first of all, we continue to do our monthly meetings. We have really advanced our monthly meetings in every country that we have our presence. Uh, and uh, I'll just give two instances uh, because these were kind of very encouraging for me. Uh, first of all, in Kenya, we, had, we have a small village that we went uh, and started as church because there were four Christians in that area. And a few weeks ago, we had an outreach where we gathered young people to go to villages and knock doors. And this is a place where uh, people have been resettled because they were in, uh, in, uh, dis- depressed, uh, depressed people and they didn't have anywhere to go. And uh, many, many of them had never heard about Jesus. And so they knocked their doors, shared the gospel from four Christians in this place. Uh, now it's gone to over 40 members in the small church that we started. And uh, so the last two, three weeks when we had these meetings, 18 people gave their lives to Jesus and committed their lives to follow Jesus Christ. And it was very, very exciting to see these people being baptized, knowing Jesus in this small uh, uh, place. And last year in August, I was there. Uh, We had raised some money to help build this church. And uh, we actually, myself and my wife, we were there to do the floor for the church. And it was exciting just to see these members that have gotten saved in the same village and now our leaders in their church. Uh, Together with many other churches, I can give examples of the churches that we are supporting, both in Kenya, Rwanda, and Congo, and it's so exciting. Um, But, John, what I shared with you the other day, 
uh, the last two weeks we had uh, my team from Pakistan. When I was there in November, I trained a uh, few pastors and challenged them and encouraged them to uh, work for the Lord and uh, amidst a lot of risky areas and persecution. And uh, they, they told me they would like to do a two, two, two weeks tour uh, using the train to different districts. So they went to four districts out of the five districts in uh, Pakistan sharing the gospel uh, to the Muslim communities. And uh, it, it, uh, it took them like 22 hours in a train one way. So they would stop to a place, uh, share the gospel for a few days, take the train again and continue on. Uh, coming back, it took them 20, uh, 22 hours in total. So you can imagine about 44 hours in total in these two weeks. And guess what? They baptized 16 people in total during those two weeks, sharing the gospel with the Muslims. It was so exciting. And the Lord protected wow. them from attacks, from persecution. You know, the hand of the Lord was upon uh, the team, and we are so, so encouraged. And um, now they are putting bigger teams together, which I'll be meeting them in, um, in, in October this year to do more training, to give them more materials and more Bibles that they may continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we, we plan to do this um, after every one month. The, every other month, we have a tour, pastors going to different districts and sharing the gospel. And so I was very excited to get pictures of 16 people being baptized. And the Lord is so good. He's doing great things. And so it's, it's encouraging. And my, the guy, who is, he's called Victor. He's now my, our coordinator for pipes in, in Pakistan and coordinating other places that we are interested in Asia. I'll be meeting him at the end of uh, April. I'll be traveling to South Korea for this conference where we will be uh, praying and strategizing on how to do missions to enriched people groups with other missionaries, like-minded people who are thinking about enriched people groups and how we can, you know, strategize to reach them with the gospel. And so my friend is coming uh, so that uh, we continue to encourage him and to empower them to do the work of the ministry among their, their own people. So I'm going just to share a few prayer items and uh, one of them, John, is, of course, the ongoing work, especially in Democratic Republic of Congo, been going on, especially uh, uh, those of us who know a little bit of the history. Uh, Congo was supposed to do election uh, last year. They say they don't have the money. You know, they have squandered all the money through corruption and all these things. So they didn't have the national election. And the president is now continuing to rule the country. Uh, his name is Kabira. And, you know, he's not legitimate at this point. And through, because of that confusion, people are fighting, and uh, we continue to feed 700 kids there and more. We continue to support 15 teachers who teach in our school so that kids who are from very poor families, orphans, uh, pygmies from the forest, can now school in this uh, facility that we built without having to think about school fees, without thinking about uniform. We provide the books. We provide everything for them. We provide a meal for them. And so a lot of the money that uh, comes through to pipes is helping kids who have gone through extremely difficult time until we are able to finally meet them by the grace of God. So keep praying for that, that we'll be a, continue to help these kids, especially in this time where they are going through a lot of difficult situation in Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and also in June and July, again, I will take a team to Congo now. Uh, I'll go to Congo. Rwanda, Kenya, and Uganda. We have a team of about 10 people that will be gathered to these countries. We'll go uh, some places two weeks, some places one week. And uh, in one place, one team will go to Uganda as another one goes to Rwanda. And every time we go now, we are really sharing with the pastors because we want to empower them and encourage them, give them the resources that they require so that they can continue on. So when we leave one country to another, they are continuing to the villages. They are going deep and deep. They identify places, and we help them with money to build churches, and we literally go there to do that. I travel a lot in so many of these countries to do the work and to just make sure that uh, the money we receive is being used well. We don't want to waste any money that people are giving to the glory of God, and we are doing that in the name of the Lord. So keep praying for that. And uh, in October, we'll be in, in, in four countries in Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and Thailand. Uh, we are already trying to raise money for Bibles. A lot of the people, John, that I met in Asia, even in Pakistan, they don't have Bibles. 
they can't afford five, six dollars to buy a Bible, and uh, we we get all this money. And when I went to Pakistan, we gave them Bibles. They were so encouraged. Some of them who have internet were putting them on Facebook to say, I got a gift from our friends from USA, Pipes International, and I was so encouraged to know that for some people, a Bible is such a precious gift. Some of us have five, six Bibles, but God is so good. So keep praying for us. Keep praying for all the children who are still at um, the care of Pipes International that couldn't go to school without the help that they are get, getting right now in Africa and now in Asia. The orphans we found in Asia, and we decided to take over to help them. So please pray for them. And I want to thank all those who support us and give their money. They are one hundred dollars, or two hundred, or fifty, or twenty-five, or five hundred, or more. Whatever you give, it's to the glory of God. It's being used in good work. It's not being wasted. I can assure you, it's being used back to the people that need it most. So thank you so much, John, for giving me the opportunity to update the people what is going on. So next month I'll be in uh, South Korea. In June, then I go to Congo, Rwanda, Uganda, and Kenya. Then maybe come back to US in August to prepare for uh, October in uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, and uh, Indonesia. So keep praying for us. We are busy. We are we are working hard, and we are praying to the Lord, and we are asking God for the harvest. You see, as I always say, the Bible says, "This kingdom of the uh, the, the kingdom of God shall be preached. The gospel shall be preached." to every nation for a witness. And uh, after every nation has heard the gospel, the end shall come. Sometimes people say, oh, everybody has heard. But for us who have been going there to the field and finding people who have no idea who Jesus is, they're asking us, is Jesus together with you right here? Is he one of you? Why don't you just show us who is Jesus here? And we start the story. It's amazing, but I thank God that people get to know Jesus and give their lives to Jesus Christ. So thank you so much, John, all the help that you give us, your own personal support, which we, we are really, really appreciate, and the many people who listen to us through this radio, and they continue to support the work of God. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. Oh, God bless you too, Brother Sammy. Praise Jesus, folks. Again, it, thanks to PayPal, we're able to rest assured that all of that money is making it into the hands of the people that need it, the kids, the churches that they're that they're seeding, the the schools that they're setting up, the clothing, the food for the kids, uh, their ability to reach out into some extremely dangerous areas of the world right now and touch people's lives and get them baptized and it's 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 amazing. It's amazing. It's it's like the Book of Acts, but it's happening in parts of the world that you know we would have never even imagined. And just thank you for your hard work, Sammy. Thank everybody. God bless you all for the contributions that you've made. Um, you know, I just. It, it is just a wonderful, awesome, wonderful work, and, and it's it's a, for me it's a peace of mind because I know that it's you know I I know you I know what you're doing I know how awesome mm. it is you can see as we can mm. see the results we know that it's not some you know creepy weird you know place that's stealing our money and all that word so God bless you so much uh, at those Amen. pipes. P I P E S like pipes in a house uh, P I P E S international.org uh and man it's a blessing thank you so much god bless you brother sammy amen all right talk to you soon brother thank you praise jesus and on that note uh let's go ahead and bring on uh sister uh terry hill oh wait 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 first real quick divine healing and deliverance show this uh tuesday night 8 to 10 p.m Again, Divine Healing and Deliverance Show with Pastor Aaron Wagner, Wagner from 8 to, to uh, uh, 10 p.m. Uh, this Tuesday night. Okay, so be there or be square. Get healed. And don't be afraid. Don't be shy. The Lord loves it when we're bold and we step out in faith. Glory to Jesus. And let people know that you know that are sick. A lot of people have walking pneumonia this time of the year. It's a great opportunity to just feel the power of God come down on you. Hallelujah. Also, shout out to West Coast Walter, who's joining us live tonight. God bless him. Sends some really great headlines that we all get to benefit. I love some of the stuff he sends over. It's like, um, dude, are you kidding me? It's like I have to double check with him and say, are you sure this is really happening? Then I find out it is, and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> so, West Coast Walter, God bless you, brother. And on that note, let's go ahead and bring on uh, Sister Terry Hill, who's been incredibly patient.
Sister Terry, are you there? I sure am, Brother John. I'm here. Uh, praise God. Thank you for being so patient. We, you know, ran over like we always do, but thank you for being so patient. God bless you. But you know what? You can, I'll tell you what, here you go. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you can talk 500 miles an hour tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, because uh, I know you have some awesome stuff to, to put out tonight, and what a blessing this is going to be for everybody that hung in there. Uh, uh, what a message! The passage to the resurrection into the depths, folks. This is going to be a real treat. God bless you, and thank you, Sister Terry. I'll turn the mic over to you now. Well, thank you, Brother John. It's always an honor and a privilege to be able to share with you a message that the Father has laid on my heart. And I would like to open this time now with prayer. So, Father, we come before you now in the mighty name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord God, for every ear that is open to hear your word. Father, I ask that you would hide me behind the cross tonight, sir, that you would put your word in my mouth. Father, I ask that indeed it would be a word in due season, that it would bring comfort and hope and challenge and exhortation. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that when you come, you bring every gift with you. I thank you, Lord God, for this time that you give, for indeed you are the measuring man and you are leading your people into the depths. And for that we praise you and thank you, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Again, I just want to thank you for the opportunity, Brother John and Brother Jose and all of you who have tuned in. It's an honor for me. And every time I come on, I ask the Father, will this be the last time? You know, we may wake up one morning and our lives could be completely changed. And the Bible says to redeem the time for the days are evil. And Jesus said, sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. But I thank you, Father, that your mercies are new every morning. And so we come to you now thanking you for the mercy and the grace to open up your word. And so, beloved, I want to talk to you tonight. The Lord has been speaking for a long time to me that he is the measuring man and he began to just lay this message out line upon line. And I just want to briefly share with you, first of all, if you want, you can go to my website. That's www.awordindueseason.com. You're also welcome to email me if you have prayer requests. I'm happy to pray with you. And that is a word in due season 777 at gmail.com the Lord began to show me that he's causing his people to pass under the shepherd's rod and we can find that in Ezekiel 20 verse 37 you can read that later but basically uh, when Ezekiel was writing and he was uh, uh, talking about the fact that our Lord is a good shepherd the shepherd's rod was a means by which the shepherd could inspect the health and the condition of each of his sheep. And again, uh, his probing, beloved, is going very deep now. So his measuring, Jesus is the measuring man. We see uh, the measuring man talked about in the book of Ezekiel. We see the measuring man talked about in the book of Revelation. And I'm seeing two parts of a picture here. So I want to uh, ask that you would please listen with ears to hear. Again, everything you hear, please take it to the Lord. Uh, every single one of us has to answer to him, and everything must be measured by the word of God. And so what I'd like to suggest to you is that the Lord's probings are going very deep now. Uh, he's causing a people to come into a standard of holiness uh, that perhaps we haven't understood in times past, measuring his rulership and his lordship within us. Now, his temple is first measured and then judged for correction, and then approved. Under the Old Testament, the temple or the Lord's house was literally a building. Under the New Testament, we know that the Word of God tells us, uh, Paul tells us that um, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our lives are not our own, and we have, we have a temple not made with hands. So in these days, the Holy Spirit dwells within a people. He doesn't dwell in buildings anymore. He dwells in a people. And his temple consists of many living stones. And he is forming a holy habitation, beloved. Let me tell you, he is the head of his body. And he is looking for a body on which to rest. He said, foxes have holes. 
Uh, Birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he wasn't talking about having a little, little building to sleep in at night. He was talking about the fact he was looking for a resting place, a temple upon which he, Jesus the head, could rest. So Jesus Christ is the measuring man. And also um, the word plumb line is an Old Testament term. We read about that in Amos 7, 7 and 8. Jesus has set a plumb line in the midst of his house. And that plumb line is dividing. It's, we're at the point now, the separation is becoming greater and greater. The Lord is making a distinction between true messengers and false messengers. He's making a distinction between Gideon and his 300 men and the army of Israel. He's making a distinction. He's dividing between those who are like Isaac and those who are like Ishmael. Ishmael is the product of the flesh, and Isaac is the promised son. He's making a distinction. A separation is occurring between those like Joseph and his half-brethren. There is a separation among the brethren. And in Joseph's case, it was persecution. Why? Because he was being prepared to rule and to reign with Christ. And so we need to understand that it's always the Father's intention, according to Ephesians 3.17 and also Ephesians 4, God's intention is to bring us to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is his goal, beloved. Now, sometimes our assignments change. Sometimes Father will give us different kinds of service or different kinds of work to do. However, his goal for us is always the same, that we would be not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds in a growing, deepening relationship with him. So he's measuring the progress of his people. Now, remember, religion measures the exterior, the outward observances of days and times and weeks. And I'm not saying in itself there's anything wrong with that, but the emphasis, if we read in Ezekiel 40, When Ezekiel had a vision of the temple, we'll find that this measuring man went inward. He wasn't uh, concerned so much with the exterior as everything within that temple was being measured. The little chambers and the windows and the breadth and the height of the gates, everything. The narrow windows. Again, windows always speaking of discernment, and if they're narrow, that this speaks of discipline. So, There is so much to be read in the Old and the New Testament. Again, I would like to share with you that the Old Testament conceals the New Testament, and the New Testament reveals the Old. So the Old Testament is a type and shadow of the New. Now, a religious mindset cannot compute. They will not comprehend because they approach these things with a mindset on the letter of the law. So that which God is revealing comes by the Spirit. Hallelujah. Again, religion measures the externals. They're concerned about what they see on the outside. But our Father is concerned about the condition of the heart and the spiritual progress of his people. So Jesus is measuring many things now. He's measuring the accuracy and the substance of the word of God that's being delivered to his people. So, again, everything has to line up with the word of God, reflecting his character and his truth and his kingdom principles. Now, his measuring for us, if we, if we understand that there is a difference, God teaches us that there's a difference between a gift and a prize. There is a gift to be received. That's eternal life, Romans 623 but there is also a prize to be won and paul talked about that there will be rewards there will be crowns given to he that overcomes and if we've read revelation chapters two and three the report card of the seven churches jesus came to each of them again as one who is measuring and discerning he saw everything there's nothing that's hidden from him but we need to understand there is a difference between seeing the kingdom and inheriting the kingdom 
we must understand that some will rule and reign with Christ and some will not. So I want to talk a little bit about that and what the Father is saying with regard to the difference. You see, we're justified freely by his grace. That is a gift of God, not of works. But if we're talking about a prize that we're contending for, and Paul talked about it again in Philippians 3, 14, 1 Corinthians 9, 24, there is a measuring because what the Lord is saying is that each must measure up to a divine specification to be duly fitted for a specific position, office, or duty. So certain qualifications are required for God's assignment. We're not talking about simply justification by faith. We're going to talk about a walk. And, beloved, we have to keep on walking. We have to continue to walk. And all through the Word of God, Uh, We are admonished over and over again to go beyond initial salvation, justification, to achieve victory over sin, over that sin that does so easily beset us, over the world's influence, over self-will, over self-seeking. Can you see that? So let me make this as plain as I can. The gift of eternal life is equal among all true believers. But not all rewards are equal. I'm going to say that again. The gift of eternal life is equal among true believers, but not all rewards are equal. Now, if we're contending for that, which the Apostle Paul was talking about, we need to understand the difference here because the Father is revealing things behind the veil and around the throne. He's beginning to show us that there are inheritance and rewards for profitable servants. So I'm talking to profitable servants tonight. Thank you, Jesus. I've got a message for those of you who are sold out, who love Jesus, who are not looking back, that you've put your hand to the plow and you've found that nothing in this world can satisfy you. I am talking to someone who's hungry tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So he's measuring us individually as his temple and corporately as his habitation. And again, everything is measured by the pattern, Hebrews 8, 5, in the heavenly realm. And the word of God tells us that Jesus is the pattern son. And in Ezekiel 43, the prophet is told, show the house to the house, let them measure the pattern. I want to comment about that. And that's in Ezekiel 43, 10. It says, I heard him speaking to me out of the house. Beloved, that's how he speaks to us now, out of the house. Glory to God. Jesus is the house, and he has a people that he occupies. He is speaking through a people. Son of man, show the house to the house of Israel. So he's saying, son of man, show the head of the house to the body of the house. It's all about Jesus. It's all about him as the pattern son and saying, this is the requirement. This is the measurement of what an overcoming son looks like. And he said, show them the form of the house and the fashion of it, the goings out and the comings in and all the lots. Write it in their sight that they would keep the whole form and the ordinances and do them. So Jesus, the pattern son, was being uh, shown here. In the Old Testament, now it may have been concealed at that time, but now under the New Testament with the Spirit of God within us and the revelation knowledge and the Holy Ghost quickening things to us, we begin to see that we, in fact, are called to show the head of the house to the body of the house. We are to declare that everyone must measure, and that word measure means to be extended, stretched, to as to come up to the measurement of the full stature in Christ. And it says we are to describe. He said describe the form and the fashion of the house, the goings out and the comings in. And he said write it down, make it plain, so that the people will understand and obey what they are shown. Hallelujah. So, Father, I thank you for that. Now, the Bible tells us that we are not to compare ourselves with others. 2 Corinthians 10:12 says, uh, those who compare themselves 
with others, with themselves, they're not wise. So we're not to look at someone else's life. We are not to look at someone else's assignment. We are to stay in our own lane and keep our focus on Jesus because our assignments are different. Hallelujah. So I thank you, Lord God. Even in Zechariah 2, 1 to 2, he says, I looked up and there was a man with a measuring line. So we see him in Ezekiel. We see him in Zechariah. We see him in the book of Revelation. He said, I'm going to measure Jerusalem to find out how wide and how long it is. And so what we, want to know, what we want to talk about right now is the fact that the Lord is leading his people into depth, all right? Previously, when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we come as little children, and that's where we all start. We start on the seashore. We start in shallow waters. Thank you, Lord. But the Lord is saying that the waters are getting wider and deeper now. And according to John 7, he said, I am the door. And we find in the book of Ezekiel, it says that he led me to the door and the waters were flowing out from under the threshold of the door. So even as the waters came down from the right side of the house in Ezekiel's vision, just as water flowed from the side of Jesus from his right side, So the house is the eternal temple of God. That's Jesus Christ, his head, and his body. Hallelujah. So the Lord is encouraging us now to keep walking and wading through those waters. The Bible tells us his voice is like the sound of many waters. And the word of God tells us, Ezekiel recorded, he said, he brought me through the waters. So There's a willingness on our part that we must be willing to be led by him and drawn by him. So what we can do is we can ask him, Father, create a greater hunger in me. Draw me by your spirit. Because, beloved, we cannot lead ourselves into the heights and the depths of the things of God. It's not in us. It is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. But what we can ask him to do is for a greater hunger. Jesus, I'm hungry for more of you. I thirst for those living waters. Jesus said uh, that there would be rivers of water that would flow out of the innermost being of those who would be his disciples. But he's also leading us through waters of adversity. And what he began to show me is that as we are being led into deeper places in Christ, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, it would perhaps explain some of the things that some of us are walking through. So the waters in the book of... um, Ezekiel also take a look at that progressive influence and spread of the gospel throughout the earth. If you recall, Jesus said, go preach this gospel and take it out first to Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then to the uttermost parts of the earth. And again, disciples are called to be fishers of men. But the Lord is saying, I'm leading you now into a deeper life in the spirit, not standing still. But we have to keep moving forward, keep walking ahead. Because the Bible tells us in Ezekiel 47, 11, stagnant, unmoving waters are swamps and marshes. So the river of God is alive. So the swamps and the marshes perhaps have received some water, but there's no water flowing out. That's why they're called swamps and marshes. So the Lord does not want us to stay in that place. Everything has to continually flow, flow in and flow out, flow in and flow out. He's leading us to a full, deep immersion into his own life, whereby we're going to be washed and sanctified and cleansed that we might become that glorious church that Ephesians 5 talks about. So the water of level increased with every 1,000 cubits, and that's Uh, In Ezekiel chapter 47 You can read that chapter later Again I have a lot of show notes You can go to my website It's there and it's on the show notes Brother John has put that up There's a lot here for those that are hungry And want to dig So a thousand cubits So what the Lord is saying Judgment is going to be laid to the line Because there was a measuring line That was used to measure the water There was a measuring reed that was used to measure the house or the temple. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus is the measuring man, and he's measuring 
everything. He's adjusting our focus. He's measuring uh, the depth of his word within us. He is measuring. He's God within us because we are his temple. He sees our strengths and our weaknesses, our physical and our emotional strength, and he knows how to strengthen us, and he knows how to take us to the next level. Hallelujah. He's adjusting and changing desires for uh, our desires within us have to come into line for his desires for us. Amen. And so he's measuring that present level of progress and maturity, and he's measuring our ability to overcome. So the pattern in the word of God, we see it in the book of Exodus. We see it, uh, what we're going to talk about here with the waters is here's the pattern. Number one, he brought me out. Secondly, he brought me through. And thirdly, he brought me to And that place that he's bringing us to is higher ground, beloved. That is an appointed place in him. It's resurrection, which is his plan and his desire for every human being. And for those who will overcome, as Paul talked about, attaining to the out-resurrection from the dead, he's talking about being a part of that first fruit company. The Lord said in Isaiah 28, he said, judgment, he said, I'm going to lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. And uh, the word of God says in Amos 5.24, but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Again, if we fully understand the benefits and the mercy of God, we were judged at the cross at sinners but we must understand the judgment begins first in God's house and that's a people so as the waters progress and get deeper we judge ourselves and the judgments come not only as sinners which is past if you are abiding in the vine the word of God say our debt as sinners sin's penalty was paid for by Jesus at the cross but notice let me qualify this When we exercise through faith, through repentance and obedience, we are given grace. No more condemnation. We're no longer under the law of sin and death. Eternal life is a gift. And Romans, the book of Romans, and we've all heard the term, the Romans road to salvation, that is a fact. Romans 3, Romans 6, Romans 8, and Ephesians all talk about that. So if we're abiding in the vine, If we walk with the Lord in a habitual fellowship, the Bible says that we were crucified with Christ. Hallelujah. And so our debt as sinners was paid. So now we can come freely into his throne. We can come with boldness and approach his throne and obtain help in time of need without condemnation. But let me talk to you about the present judgment now of those who are walking with Christ. There are two other judgments. The first one was as a sinner, but we're also judged as sons and as servants. Now let me explain that because judgment is coming as well to an ungodly nation. But we are being judged now, and the Bible tells us to judge ourselves now. When we're judged as sons, this is a continual judgment that is present it's through the new birth that we're born into god's kingdom family and we become heirs okay so when i was born as my dad's daughter i was his heir but so inheritance is a son's birthright it is not earned but it's given on the basis of relationship with the heavenly father and the bible tells us that god disciplines and chastens every son Romans 8, 17, Galatians 4, Hebrews 12. God disciplines and chastens every son. Now, we're also judged as servants. Let me explain. This judgment is also both present and also in the future. So varying degrees of obedience and sacrifice among God's servants who are sons will determine rewards and future roles in God's kingdom. A reward is given for service rendered for work done a true servant ministers or serves because he is a son not to earn salvation which is a gift 
all right? So we're talking now about those who are walking with Christ, and the Lord is saying, keep walking, keep walking. Because what's happening, we begin, our beginning stage, we have to be proven as faithful stewards. We're not talking about now this thief on the cross experience, and many people bring this up. At the moment that this man who hung on a cross next to Jesus heard the conversation going everywhere, and he said, this man has done nothing. He said this to the other thief on the other side of Jesus. He said, we deserve our punishment, but this man has done nothing. At that moment, the Spirit of God ministered to this thief on the cross, and he looked at Jesus. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' words to him, at that moment, that man recognized this is the word of, this is the son of God that is next to me. He said, I tell you, this day you will be with me in paradise. So we talk often about a deathbed experience. That's a perfect example. But I have to tell you, beloved, this man did not live a life as an overcomer. Do you see that he was justified? He was justified by faith alone. But those of us that understand that decisions that we're making today are going to determine where we land in eternity, we're going to take this seriously. See, we're going to talk first of all about in the book of Ezekiel, the water started rising. You see, there was a man, the measuring man had a line in his hand and he measured a thousand cubits. And it says that he brought me through the waters, which were to the ankles, and that's Ezekiel 47.3. So our progress is being measured, beloved, and this is where we all begin. We begin on the shores. And now the Lord is saying, now come and follow me. And he beckons to his bride, come to me. So with each level that we go into, the Lord is saying, you have to be, are you overcoming? What is the obstacle you're facing today? Are you overcoming? Are you persevering? Are you walking in love? Or are you angry with me? Are you angry with people? Are you frustrated? You must understand that all things, it is written, work together for them that love God, that are called according to his purpose. So water to the ankles is the beginning of our walk with the Lord. And we're now being surrounded by the water, the influence of the Holy Spirit and the word of God. So our feet are wet with the waters of conversion and regeneration. Thank you, Jesus that we were led, notice, Ezekiel said, he brought me to this place. He brought me through the waters to the ankles. This is the Lord's doing, hallelujah, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Beloved, he chose you. You didn't choose him. Did you know that? But when he turns the light on and we begin to see the plan of God and the amazing privilege that it is to walk with him and the amazing thought, as I read in Second Peter 1.11, The Bible says that there will be those who will have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. Did you know that? 2 Peter 1.11, some will have an abundant entrance into the kingdom, but others will be saved as by fire. Jude 23, it says others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And Hebrews Chapter 2, verse 3, talks about a great salvation, and Jude 3 talks about a common salvation. So there's much here, levels and dimensions of salvation. So in the water to the ankles, this is a place where the lambs wade in the shallows. And so those with a weak capacity, like babes or little children, thrive upon the milk of the word. And these are the elementary doctrines, Hebrews 5, verse Peter 2. So with our feet, we rise up and leave Egypt, right? So that's a picture of leaving the world. It is a picture of leaving the bondage to a worldly system where we begin our walk by faith. And our walk among the brethren begins here. We're justified through faith and we're pardoned through the blood of Jesus Christ. But listen, beloved, Hebrews 6, 1 and 2 says, We have to leave and go beyond the basic principles of the doctrines of Christ. We have to go on to perfection. We have to go on to maturity. And so the Lord is saying, now come deeper, keep walking. And 
Hebrews 6, 1 and 2 talks about six basic foundational doctrines. And, beloved, many places aren't even covering these throughout Christendom, throughout what we would call the Church of Laodicea. They're not talking about repentance from dead works. That's one of them. They, there's the second point, faith toward God. Third, doctrine of baptism. Fourth, laying on of hands. Five, the resurrection of the dead. Six, eternal judgment. According to the word of God, those are the basic principles. This is babyhood. This is water to the ankle. Hallelujah. And Paul told the church at Corinth in Corinthians 3.12, he said, Brethren, I couldn't even speak to you as spiritual men. He said, I have to speak to you as babes in Christ. He said, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you weren't able to receive it. You see, there was a problem at the church of Corinth. Uh, There was a party spirit. There was contention. Uh, There was jealousy. There was strife. And there was allegiance to men and their denominations. Beloved, this is carnal stuff. We're not going to grow up if we're sucked into that. So we have to repent of those things. We've got to stop comparing ourselves and making man our God and following after man. Does that mean we don't glean from the ministry? Certainly not. Of course we do. But the problem at the church of, of Corinth is that they said, one says, I'm a Paul, one of Apollos, one of Jesus, one of this one. And Paul said, there's a party spirit here. There's contention here. And so there were factions. So the Lord has to uh, remove that carnality in our lives. And when we recognize these things, we have to repent of it and say, Father, I, forgive me. I see that. I want to go on with you. Create in me, Lord God, a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me, Lord God. So water to the ankle is just the beginning, beloved. So let's move on now. Uh, he said, a man with a line in his hand measured another thousand cubits. And he brought me through the waters which were to the knees. And that's Ezekiel 47, 4. So knees in scripture speak of relationship with God. When we pray, we get down before him on our knees, right? So it speaks of communion and prayer as bowing and worship. So the knees are important for the strength of the walk. And in fact, um, Isaiah 35 and Hebrews 12 talks about the fact that knees can even point to a, a weakness or a lack of faith. So they must be strengthened to walk long distances. When our hunger grows, we beg for more of God. So in the beginning stages, it's all about us. It's all about our friends. It's all about this, uh, how busy we can be in the church. And I'm not saying it's not good to be committed. Please hear me carefully. But our focus begins to change from the house of God to the head of the house. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we begin to beg, Jesus, I'm hungry for you. Show me more of you. Reveal yourself to me. There's an intensity and a hunger for the word of God. It begins to grow, and it's like a begging on our knees. God, reveal yourself to me. Show yourself to me. Speak to me. And that is uh, symbolic of the water to the knees. Now let's keep going. It says, and then the man with a line in his hand measured another thousand cubits, he brought me through the waters which were to the loins, and that's Ezekiel 47.4. So the loins now speak of reproduction, the ability to reproduce the life of Christ in others. So this is pointing to an individual who is living the spirit-filled life, and it indicates a high level of spiritual activity. So the loins also speak of digestion, one who is able to digest the meat of the word, And those in this category have put away childish things. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul said, one season I was a child. I spoke and I thought as a child. He said, but then I put away childish things. So we gird up the loins of our mind and we're sober and we receive only his thoughts. So those in this category are reproducing the life of Christ. They're winning people to Christ. They're filled with the Holy Ghost. They're moving in the things of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God, and it's not a reproducing of themselves, not a reproducing of what their denomination says, but a reproducing of the life of Christ. Hallelujah, because it's the head. Remember what uh, the Lord told Ezekiel, show the head of the house to the body of the, of, of the house, right? So we're not showing our preferences, our denomination, 
Our ministry, no, we're showing Jesus. Take a look at the head, loved ones. Let's keep our focus on the head of the house, not the body of the house. Again, let's keep going. Then in a man with a line in his hand measured another thousand cubits. And it says, this was a river that I could not pass over for the waters were risen. Beloved, that's where we are right now. Hallelujah. Ezekiel 47, 5, waters to swim in. Now something happens at this level. This is what the Lord had been showing me. And it's explaining some of the stuff and the trials and the testing that his people are going through you see we're led through deep waters that's isaiah 63 13 at this place what the lord is showing me we lose the ability to muddy the waters with our feet i want to say that again we lose the ability to muddy the waters with our feet to try to work up a flow with the foot pumps of egypt and that's uh deuteronomy 11 10 in other words No more trying to work it up to get a flow. No more of this fleshly stuff is operating. It's done. It's over because we've come to the end of our own abilities. We can't touch bottom. We've been cut loose from the earth. We can't even feel it. We've got to swim or we're not going to make it. And let me tell you something, beloved. You're going to make it. Keep your eyes on Jesus. If you have come to the end of your own resources, if you've come to the end of your own wisdom, Come to that place of absolute frustration. You say, I give up, Jesus. I can't make another step, another day without you. Glory to God. I'm here to tell you you're right in that place where he wants you to be. This means we finally are learning to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ, the head of the body, not depending on the members of the body, but looking to the head whose name is Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the author and the finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. And it's in this place we begin to enter his rest. We're not kicking against the pricks like Saul. Hallelujah. Thinking we're serving God with a religious mindset. Nope. The Lord said, I'm going to bring you to the place. You're going to have an encounter with me, and your life will never be the same. Hallelujah. It's the laying down of my own will. When we're launched into the depths and cut loose from the earthly ties and we lose control of our own lives, waters to swim in. We're being fully upheld by the living waters of the world, of the word of God, yielding to the flow of the Holy Spirit, not my will, not a pastor's will, not a denomination's will, but the will of my Father and beloved, I got news for you. Jesus will lead you outside the camp. Hallelujah. It's a yielding to the will of the Father. Jesus was crucified outside the camp. And I'm here to tell you, you got to get outside the camp and get alone with Jesus. you got to be tested. you got to be proven in that wilderness experience. you got to come face to face with the enemy who will try to harass you, who will try to tell you you can still do God's work in the strength of your flesh. i got news for you. When God brings you to this place of waters to swim in, You don't care what anybody's thinking. All you need is him to survive. You need his grace and his strength to make it. Glory to God. And that is a good place to be. When we're being carried by faith, fully immersed in the water and swimming, hallelujah. Think about in those days when you took swim lessons, right? You remember the breaststroke? You kept plowing forward, right? When you were fully immersed in the water and swimming, guess what? The the prominent part of the body that is seen is the head, right? Sometimes the shoulders or the arms come up out of the water, but the head is always seen. Do you know that's the goal for each one of us, the Father has for us, is that the prominent part of our lives that would be seen is the head, Jesus, hallelujah, glory to God, because we're swimming, glory to God. So this stage, this is what he began to show me, is preparing us for the redemption of our mortal bodies. Every victorious saint will pass through the realm of the depths. Psalm 42, 7, that's the deep dealings of God, the trials, the prisons, 
the purging, a complete testing, and a thorough proving, which qualifies an individual as determined by the Lord. And I must tell you, please hear me carefully, no person can be robed in immortality or be glorified to rule and reign with Christ unless they meet the necessary requirements to attain to the out-resurrection from among the dead. That's Philippians 3, 10, and 11. It says that we are going to go through the depths. We have to qualify. Again, we're talking about roles in the kingdom. Beloved, there's a millennial kingdom coming, and there's a qualifying for roles. There's a price to be paid now. And Jesus used an illustration of one who gave all that he had to teach his disciples. Remember the little woman in Mark's gospel? She cast everything, all of her living, into the treasury. Let me tell you, it's time to put everything we can, our energies, our time, our talent, our treasure, into God's kingdom. Beloved, we don't have much time left. We have to redeem the time. Hallelujah. And seeing the kingdom, if you can see with eyes to see, ask him, Father, give me eyes to see. It will cause you to sell all that you have to obtain the glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Disciples are going to lose their own life. Lord, you're going to lose your own life. You're going to deny yourself and carry the cross. There are some depths that we're going to walk through. We're going to endure some fiery trials. And so if you're trying to bring this stuff to folks that are sitting in a seeker-friendly, watered-down, people-pleasing, lukewarm environment, they're not going to want to hear you. You're going to be told you're too extreme. You're going to be told you're legalistic. You're too narrow-minded. But let me tell you something. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and there be few therein that find it. The Lord says, I'm leading my people into the depths. Glory to God. Those who are going to rule and reign with Christ are going to experience the deep dealings of God, the deep searchings of God. And we're going to find, beloved, there are treasures in the depths, just like a pearl. A pearl is formed and discovered in deep waters. We've got to dive and dig and search. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways are past finding out and so the psalmist talked about in psalm 69 he said i've come and that's david remember a man who god says is after my own heart listen to what he said read psalm 69 later he said i've come into deep waters he was talking about deep affliction deep trouble and he cried out to god let not the water flood overflow me neither let the deep swallow me up this was a cry of distress. This was a man who'd been anointed three times, first as a prophet, then as a priest, and as a king. And again, those living waters that will be flowing out of God's people will be the summary of all three. It'll be a prophetic flow, a priestly flow, and a kingly flow. Living waters in the prophetic flow, as the water flows out of the belly, which points to prophetic ministry, there is going to be a priestly flow. Uh, this is an anointing as a mediator, one who intercedes in men's behalf. Now, remember the simple gift of prophecy. We're talking about a, uh, a gift, just a, a prophet, prophecy as itself, is an anointing to declare God's message and reveal God's heart to men. In fact, Paul tells the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 14, he said, Wherefore, my brethren, covet to prophesy. So that's simply preaching, it's foretelling, and he says, forbid not to speak with tongues. So even among prophetic gifts, there are different degrees. Some are seers, some have a gift of prophecy, some stand in the office of a prophet. So in, uh, in the days to come, and especially in the kingdom, when Jesus returns, we're going to see this flow of prophetic ministry, this flow of priestly ministry, and a flow of the kingly ministry because the river flows out of the throne. So we're talking about David here in Psalm 69. We need to understand that this is a man who had a heart for God. This man was a worshiper. Hallelujah. 
And so the kingly flow, let me just talk about that for a moment, and we're going to keep going about the depths. This is an anointing of one who governs and rules from a throne with authority because there is power in the word of a king. That's Ecclesiastes 8.4. Beloved, we need to understand that the simple gift of prophecy is encouraging others, building up, edifying, strengthening them. It's declaring God's message and revealing God's heart. And all of us as witnesses for Christ to do that, whether we realize that or not, when we truly share the gospel, we are acting in that place where we're declaring God to men. Now, the priestly ministry and role was different, right? So this was one who was a mediator who intercedes in men's behalf, okay? One who offers up spiritual sacrifices, and we do that now. But the kingly flow will be understood to a greater degree with the people, as Jesus said, they will be kings and priests unto God. So a king is a judge who takes dominion and administers justice, okay? And Revelation 24 says, I saw thrones and those that sat upon them, and judgment was given to them, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So right now we are learning. We are practicing, if you will. It's training time for reigning time. So we're learning now to take authority and dominion and to judge ourselves because these kings and priests unto God who will come forth as the the royal priesthood now are judging and discerning, now um, are taking authority and dominion over the enemy. In the Old Testament, these were all separate roles and assignments. Remember? Remember? We've read the Old Testament, but when King Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom, we're going to see a magnificent flow of the prophetic and the priestly and the kingly ministries all combined together. Hallelujah. So let's go back to King David, who is crying out to God in Psalm 69. Why? Because he said, I've come into deep waters. He said, it is deep. God, don't let the deep swallow me up. The Bible tells us in Psalm 106.9, it says God rebuked the Red Sea, and it was dried up. It said he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. So when I asked the Father, he kept saying a deeper level. I said, could you please tell me? He said, yes. He gave me 30. He gave me 30 points, and I want to touch on them really quickly. And again, these are in the handouts. Number one, he said, you're going to be seeing a deeper level of relationship with your heavenly father, drawing us, beloved. And as we cry out to him and hungering him, hungering, thirst for him, he will reveal himself. Uh, Jesus said, if a man loves me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come. Did you get that? We will come unto him and make our abode with him. That's John's gospel. John fourteen twenty three. Where what else? The Lord said, I asked him. He gave me thirty. So here's the second one. He said, Persecution is going to be growing. A deeper level of persecution. Jesus said it. He said, If they persecuted me, they're gonna persecute you. A growing depth, a growing relationship with the Father, but also greater persecution. What else? He said of worship. And we know that Jesus said, Those who worship will worship him in spirit and in truth. In fact, the measuring man in Revelation, uh, he's talking to John, Revelation 11.1, he said, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Did you know that our worship is measured? That's what the word of God tells us. He is the measuring man. So there's going to be a deepening worship, a growing worship. And the fourth point of separation, he said, this will become more and more distinct. A growing separation. As the word of God tells us, come out from among them and be separate. Folks, we used to be able to fellowship with. The Lord's going to make a distinction. He's setting the plumb line in the midst of his house. And when we hear nonsense coming out of the mouths of people, when we hear over and over again things that grieve the spirit of God, we cannot stay in those places. Yes, he may send us places to bring a message, to bring a word, and to perhaps bring correction. But let me tell you, you're going to be finding yourself so uncomfortable, the Lord is going to pull you out. He's going to pull you out of the camp, 
and bring him unto, unto himself. What else will be growing? The faith. Luke 17, the apostle said, Lord Jesus, increase our faith. Your faith is going to a deeper level. Judgment is coming to a deeper level. 1 Corinthians 11:32. when we are judged, we're chastened by the Lord so that we would not be condemned with the world. He said, your obedience will grow as you seek me. He said, a growing, deeper level of obedience. Let's remember what it says in Hebrews 5, 8. He says, though he, Jesus, were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Oh, wow. So that means that we're not going to be sheltered or hidden or kept from suffering. No, beloved, it's coming. A deeper level of suffering and obedience goes hand in hand and falling more and more in love with him. A depth in our beings. God is doing it. He's bringing us into deep waters. And there will be a depth of compassion that God's going to work in us. It says Jesus was moved with compassion toward them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Deeper suffering. If we suffer with him, the word of God says we're going to reign with him. Second Timothy 2.12, increasing tribulation. And the word of God tells us, Acts 14, 22, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and we must, through much tribulation, I'm going to say that again, we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Increasing revelation, that's growing deeper. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 1, 17, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. What else is growing? What else will be deeper? The Lord said of patience. You're going to learn to be patient. For you have need of patience. That's what Paul told the uh, Hebrews 10.36. You have need of patience. If you're like me, beloved, I wanted it done yesterday. God doesn't work like that. He sits in eternity, and here we are in the finite realm, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we hear the word of the Lord come soon. You know what? Brother John mentioned that. He said, i do not so sure I like that word soon because it's never soon enough for me. Glory to God. Yes, Jesus, I need patience. Help us, Lord. What else is growing? What else will become deeper? Accusation that will come from the enemy. Listen, it's what he showed me. This is scripture that he gave me. It's in Luke 23, 2. Notice, it says they began to accuse him, Jesus saying, we found this perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. Did you get that? There will be some patriots among the camps of people who are Christians that will say that you're missing it because you're not showing your allegiance to Caesar. And that's Luke 23, 2. You're perverting the nation. Why aren't you standing with the nation? Let me tell you something, loved ones. The Bible says that when we come to Christ, that we belong to a new kingdom now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're not citizens of this world anymore. That word world, look it up in your strongs. It means this present world order. We don't belong here. We're sent here on assignment. We are here being processed, tested, tried, and fitted for eternity. The Lord said accusations are going to grow as well. What else? He said, your love is going to grow. All the law is fulfilled in one word. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He said also, the next thing, he said, reproach will be at a deeper level. And First Peter 4.14, he said, if you reproach for the name of Christ, happy are you for the spirit of glory and the spirit of God rests upon you. What else will be growing? What else as we walk into deeper waters? What will God be doing within us? A deep work of the spirit of wisdom. Colossians 1.9. That ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Beloved, the Lord will be opening up more mysteries in his word and the things of the spirit. I believe many will be having encounters with angels that have not had them before. I believe the spirit world is being opened more and more to those that are heavenly minded. Hallelujah. What else is going to be deepening? What else is going to be uh, a greater depth? The Lord said sorrow. And in Romans 9, 2, listen to what Paul said. And you'll understand this, especially to the intercessors. You understand this. 
Paul said, I have great heaviness and I have continual sorrow in my heart. A burden for the lost, a burden to pray for the church, a burden to reach those, to prepare them for the coming of the Lord. And that is our assignment, beloved, to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. What else will be deepening? He said, self-denial. You have to deny yourself and take up your cross to follow him. What else is deepening? What else is at a deeper level? He said, rejection. The Bible tells us in Luke 17, 25, that first Jesus, and that's both head and body, must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. This generation is not going to be happy with you when you tell them if you've broken the law, you're guilty of breaking all the law if you offend at one point. You see, we must show people the law, therefore showing them that they need a Savior because if we just miss it just in one point, the Bible says we're guilty of violating all of God's law and none of us can keep God's law. We all need a Savior. Thank you, Jesus. But beyond his being our Savior, we now need to embrace him as Master and Lord of all. What else did the Lord say? He showed me. He said, you're going to see miraculous supply increasing. So greater depths because a greater need requires a greater work of the miraculous. The Lord says, you just watch and wait what I will do, how I will sustain those who love me. He said, fear not, beloved. Fear not, little flock. It is the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. My God's going to supply all of your needs, beloved, according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.19. He said there's going to be a greater and increasing, deepening travail. Isaiah talked about it in Isaiah 21. He said, my loins are filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me like the pangs of a woman who's travailing. He said, your joy's going to increase. Joy unspeakable and full of glory, the Bible tells us, The joy that was set before him, Jesus, he endured the cross, despised the shame. Hallelujah. There is something ahead of us, beloved, and it's bigger than the picture that we see. What else is going to be deepening as we go through the depths? The Lord says, greater perseverance in prayer, praying always in the spirit, watching with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. What else? The next thing he said, you're going to see a greater display of supernatural power. Glory to God, because we serve a supernatural God. We walk in the supernatural kingdom, and signs and wonders are a normal part of the spirit-filled life. Hallelujah. If there's no signs, if there's no wonders, folks aren't being delivered. Folks aren't being healed. Folks, it's time to find another church. Let me tell you something. The closer we get to him, the smaller our little group will become because we'll find that he'll bring us in, bring us in with those that are like-minded because the word of God is telling us right now. He said deep is calling unto deep. And God is going to supernaturally join you and I to folks of like-minded. He said even as species of fish swim together, the Lord says I'm going to draw you by my spirit and you're going to swim together as one. And when one turns, they all turn. Hallelujah supernatural power you're going to see like paul said my preaching did not just come with enticing words of men's wisdom he said i came in the demonstration of the spirit and of power glory to god hallelujah a bride so submitted being washed and cleansed sanctified hallelujah washing your garments moving by the power of the Holy Spirit. Glory to God, who has a sound mind that flows with truth and revelation, not tradition. Hallelujah. Peace of mind, peace in the heart, in the midst of chaos, confusion, and trials. Hallelujah. Overcoming kingdom power, the ability to live a victorious overcoming lifestyle in faith and obedience. The ability to live above the filth of this world in purity and holiness. Glory to God. A life that consistently yields to the headship of Jesus Christ. Beloved, that's the overcoming life. Hallelujah. Laying down our life. as The Lord says, watch me. You'll see the supernatural. Because, beloved, it's in that place of desperation. Again, God will supply. 
God's nature has always been to take care of his people, and he has not changed. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he is not about to change. He said also there will be a growing level of mistreatment of my people, a deeper depth, a a bitter pill to swallow, if you will. He said, and the scripture that he gave me, he said, remember my servant Micaiah, 1 Kings 22, remember him? He spoke the truth. Ahab had all his yes men, all the false prophets, but Micaiah spoke the truth. And you know what the king said about him? He said, I hate him because he doesn't prophesy good to me. Hallelujah. You see, Zedekiah smote him on the cheek, slapped him across the face. He said, put this fellow in prison and feed him with the bread of affliction and with the water of affliction. The Lord showed me, he said, mistreatment of my servants will increase. He said, but there will be a greater depth of reward, knowing that of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will receive the reward of the inheritance a greater and deepening level of afflictions. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver him out of them all. Deepening ministry and service specifically, the Lord said. In fact, he used it to show me, he said, there is such a thing as a general practitioner, but then there are specialists. The Lord said, watch for the specialty ministries. He says, I'm raising up specialized ministry Folks that uh, have been prepared their entire lives three at an appointed time, the Lord said, watch and see, stay in the word of God and measure everything by the word of God. Hallelujah. The measuring man is reminding us that that line of flax is straight and it's truthful and it's clean and it's pure. And that measuring rod, because you see our good shepherd has both a rod and a staff. Hallelujah. It's straight it keeps us on the path that leads to life and then he said a grading uh, excuse me a growing uh, measure of humility humility the lord said i resist the proud but i give grace to the humble hallelujah and finally the third thing that he, the 30th thing that he showed me of all of these things he said that will be growing in intensity a deeper level he said of glory Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, Second Corinthians 3.18. He said, we're changed into that same image from glory to glory. You see, beloved, he takes us from faith to faith. That's Romans 1.17. He takes us from strength to strength. That's Psalm 84.7. And he takes us from glory to glory. That's Second Corinthians 3.18. You see, water to the ankles is a degree of glory. Water to the knees is another degree of glory. Water to the loins, another degree of glory. Waters to swim in, a greater degree of glory. And the beautiful thing about that, it says in Ezekiel 47, 6 to 7, it says, then he brought me to the brink of the river. Beloved, that's solid ground. That's where the trees of the Lord are established and planted on the bank of the river, that's Psalm 1-3. His goal is to lead us to higher ground, resurrection ground. Hallelujah. Psalm 18, 33. Habakkuk 3 He gives us the feet of a deer. He gives us the ability to walk upon those high places. So after the prophet Ezekiel saw all these things, it said then that he, the Lord, brought me to the brink of the river. And again, we must be led there. He brings us there. And so all that we walk through and the depths that are growing and increasing, hallelujah, it says he brings us to the brink of the river. And that's where we set our feet on solid ground. Beloved, that is the resurrection life. That is the higher ground. Hallelujah. You know, 1 Corinthians 2.10 says, But God is revealing these things to us by his Spirit. For the Spirit is searching all things, yea, the deep things of God. And Ephesians 3.17-19 says that ye may be able to comprehend, now listen to this, with all the saints, what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, to know the love of Christ. Can you see it's all summed up in love? 
And I want to comment again, the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height to know the love of Christ that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. So you see, this is a picture like of a cube, right? Perfect dimensions, balance, height, depth, length, and breadth. Like the most holy place in the Old Testament, it was a perfect cube, as in the city that lieth four square, four square meaning uh, a balance, a perfect balance, everything in order, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord is bringing us to that place of the depths. He's opening his word. And for us to come to that place, to come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, we're going to have to walk through these depths. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus again shared this with me, so I'm going to share it with you. It's out of Matthew 23, 31 and 32. Jesus told the wicked leaders of his generation, he said, you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Now listen what he said. Fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. We need to understand that sin has a weight on the land. There is a weight of glory, and there is also a weight of sin. And when the iniquity is full, beloved, in certain areas, cities, and geographical locations, we're going to see the judgment of God coming. Calamities are unfolding. There are things coming. In Ezekiel 14:21, the Lord talks about the four severe judgments, or what he calls sore judgments is what the King James says. He said, they're coming. Ezekiel 14:21. let me give you, there's four of them. Sword, famine, some beasts, which are demonic entities, and pestilence. And if you go back and you read the section in Ezekiel 14, you'll see that the Lord tells, he said, Son of man, when the land sins grievously. Okay? He said, I'm going to break the staff of bread. I'm going to send famine. Now, we need to know there's two dimensions here. Not only are we going to see in the natural food uh, and the drought and so on, different things happening, but there's also a famine in the land for the word of God. Where do you go to hear the full word of God? Where do you go to get the counsel of God? Where do you go to hear from God that's not watered down and lukewarm, that panders to the lazy and the lukewarm? Because the Bible tells us it's the hand of the diligent that will bear rule. So if we're not being diligent, beloved, if we're careless, lazy, indifferent, not disciplined, not pressing in, not turning from sin, not casting aside the works of darkness, not cutting off the works of the flesh. Do you really think that Jesus would entrust us to rule and to reign with him? No. The answer is no. The hand of the diligent will bear rule. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hebrews 11:6. Without faith it's impossible to please him. He that comes to God must believe that he is. And the word says he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. He said, occupy until I come. Hallelujah. Proverbs 12, 24. Listen to this. Diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in slave labor. That is coming as well. Oh, help us, Lord. Help us, Jesus. To be obedient to you today. Help us, Jesus, to pay the price today. Help us, Jesus, to desire to know you more intimately, Lord God. To hold fast to your teachings. To manifest the life of Christ. For we have one master, no man, no denomination, no movement is master over us. But the head of the house, the Lord said, show the head of the house to the body of the house. So glory to God, that's what we're doing tonight. Hallelujah. We must forgive continually. Disciples are counted worthy. Did you know that? Jesus said, watch and pray always that you would be accounted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Counted worthy. Disciples love their enemies. Disciples don't love the things of the world. 
disciples want to spend time alone with Jesus more than they want to be with anybody else doing anything else alone with the Father. Hallelujah. Disciples want to know the Father intimately. The Lord says that it's a season. Ask me, and I will place a greater hunger in your heart that I could reveal myself to you. Disciples enter the kingdom through much tribulation. Anybody who tells you that we're going to skirt right through all this and that God doesn't love us to allow us to suffer, that is a lie. The Bible tells us so. Even the Son of God learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Hallelujah. Disciples are made a spectacle. Did you know that? Paul said it. He said, we're made a spectacle unto the world. We're fools for Christ's sake. We are despised. He said, even to this present hour, we're hungry and thirst, thirsting. We're naked. We're buffeted. We have no certain dwelling place. We work with our hands. We're reviled. We bless. We're persecuted and we suffer. Being defamed, we entreat. We're made as the filth of the world. The offscouring of things unto this day, it said, we were made a gazing stock, a spectacle by reproach and afflictions. Beloved, if we read all of God's word and not just the parts we like, we will find that we're going to walk through some things. But on the other side, I tell you, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for those who love him. Beloved, are you ready to swim? Are you ready to dive into the depths and go swimming? Are you ready to see a supernatural move of God? a deep, deep work of the Spirit as you pass under the shepherd's rod because, beloved, he is measuring. He is measuring, and his probings are going deep. Finally, I want to just remind any one of you who are listening tonight, you say, Sister Terry, I'm hurting so bad. I can't take another step. What am I going to do, beloved? My advice to you is to lean on the ever lasting arms and with that i'm going to close and i'm going to thank you thank you brother john i give all praise and glory and honor to you beloved keep walking keep pressing and keep moving forward in jesus name amen and amen praise god that is awesome that is awesome glory to jesus and uh, Sister Terry, would you share with folks real quick, before you close with the prayer, would you share with folks real quick where they can go and get more information again? Of course. You can uh, reach me at the website, and that's www.awordindueseason.com. My email address, awordindueseason777 at gmail.com. Praise God. And uh, and we're down to the last four minutes of the program. But do you want to close with a prayer for us tonight? Oh, I'd be happy to. Oh, Father, how we give you all the praise and the glory that you have called us. We have not called ourselves. We simply say yes to you, Father. And we love you. And we thank you for the grace that you've given us, Lord. We thank you that you're revealing yourself to us. We thank you, Lord God, that we have an urgency within us to share the gospel with all who will listen. We thank you, Father God, for your great grace and for your mercies that are new every morning. And we give all praise, all glory, and all honor to the head of the church, whose name is Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much. What a powerful message, Sister Terry. God bless you all for joining us tonight. Don't forget about the Deliverance and Divine Healing Show with Pastor Aaron Wagner Tuesday night. You know, hook people up. Let them know if they're hurting and they need help. You know, just let them know to call in. It's a blessing. It's been blessing, touching people's lives and changing them. Thank you so much, Sister Terry, for joining us. Uh, and uh, and we're looking forward to the next program, the next teaching. So just, you know, let Thank me know. You. As Praise as, the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Thank you so much. And God bless you all for joining us tonight. Be ye doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, deceiving yourselves. James 1.22. Get the word out. Time is getting shorter. 
by every day. Hallelujah. Talk to you soon, everyone. See you then. God bless you.